what would a new personality who's not competitive live like? What, 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 how would I have to think? How would a, how would a person who, who's no longer competitive have to think? And you start thinking about how to think. And the act of actually with intention or attention actually begins to install new circuitry in your brain, new hardware. Keep doing it. And it becomes like a software program. That becomes the new voice in your head mm. that says, ease up, there's another way to do it. And then if you said, how am I going to be in my life when I open my eyes? How am I going to live today, one day, one lifetime, as if I wasn't competitive? Okay, well, I may have to read a little bit and learn a little about how to do that, but I can find somebody that did that. Obviously, someone has. If you closed your eyes and you rehearsed mentally, how are you going to be on a Zoom call? How are you going to be with your colleagues? How are you going to be in your relationships? Mental rehearsal, when you're truly present, the brain does not know the difference between the real life experience and what you're imagining. And the research on mental rehearsal says you can install neurological hardware in your brain to look like you've already done it. That's already been experienced. Mm -hmm. Now your brain is no longer a record of the past. Now it's a map to the future. Keep priming the brain with those instructions and the hardware will become a software program. Now you'll start behaving that way. Now here's the hard part, which you accomplished. Can I teach my body emotionally what it would feel like to no longer be competitive, to be in love with life and know that everything's gonna work out or that I'm resourceful or intelligent or whatever it is? Can I bring up the feeling of what the competitive, non-competitive person or a person who's mastered that feels like? If you can teach your body emotionally what that feels like before the experience, then it would make sense then if you could do that enough times, you can condition your body emotionally to begin to change with that thought and that feeling, with mm. that image and that emotion. And so then the person becomes a new personality <laughs> and changes from the old personality. And our research shows when you do that, not only do you change your circuitry, the way your brain works, the way your heart works, your gene expression, your immune system, but the side effect of that a lot of times is there's very profound biological changes that take place in the person's health. Mm -hmm. And you say, how did you do that? And they'll tell you, <laughs> that disease exists in the old personality. I'm literally somebody else. So if you have evidence and testimony, which we do have, that it's mm. possible to change, and we have great evidence in scientific research that we're doing, evidence becomes the loudest voice. And that person who stands on the stage and tells the story of their personal transformation, and they're speaking the truth, they're the four minute mile. And that's a new level of consciousness that says, I don't need anything outside of me to change my internal state. Yeah. I could actually self-regulate and change my internal state. And the more I understand what I'm doing based on, the, based on the model of science and why I'm doing it made simply, then the how gets easier because you assign meaning to it. And when you assign meaning to it, you switch on that prefrontal cortex and it will find value in the act. If mm -hmm. you don't know what you're doing and why you're doing it, it's left to conjecture, to superstition, to dogma. And so then lighting a match in a dark place and taking a look at what aspect of yourself, if you want to be happy, then the first thing you have to do is stop being unhappy. you got to become conscious of those thoughts that make you feel bad yeah. and the memories that go along with it and the emotions of that. And, 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 and disentangling from that program uh, takes a lot of energy and a lot of awareness. You mentioned visualization there, really, the, this theme of creating the emotion and the feeling now. You're not waiting for something to happen in the future so you can experience that feeling. You, you're actually taking control of that and creating that feeling immediately, which is very powerful. And what I think of when you say that is I think about sports people. Tiger Woods, for example, the night before playing 18 holes, he'd be in bed and he would literally be playing every single hole, every shot, picturing where it's going to land, walks up, plays that shot. Is it going to be a little draw? It's going to be a little cut. Is it going to be low? Is it going to be high? To the point where he and other golfers will say, when they show up to actually play, they've already played the course. So I know a mutual friend of ours, David Hamilton, when I spoke to him on the show a couple of years ago, David spoke about tennis for him and how, you know, never really played before. 
And I think within a few months or within a year, he was actually doing really well in the men's leagues through this kind of process of visualization. So I think when we hear about it from sports folk, we, we get it. We go, yeah, yeah, it's important for them. But, you know, many of us don't think about it with our own health. We think that the way we feel is the way we feel. Oh, you know, I, I happen to feel low and sad. The other thing that I discovered whilst I was researching uh, for this, for this um, conversation, uh, Dr. Joe, was there's this wonderful TED talk by a chap called Anil Seth. He's a, a global researcher in consciousness at, at the University of Sussex. And in his TED talk, he shows this wonderful image of a human being. Literally, there's a false hand in front of them. And he's looking at that false hand. And then after a few seconds, someone drops a knife in on the false hand and he pulls his real hand away. It's so profound. And this really speaks to what you've just been saying, which is your brain doesn't know the difference. Yeah. We don't see things how they are. We see things how we are. And so the, I, I don't like to use the word visualization because I think it's been... Okay, it's been overused. I like to use the word mental rehearsal. I don't care if you're a virtuoso uh, musician. I don't care if you are a performer or an actor. I don't care if you're a dancer or an athlete. Everybody does this who's engaged in getting better at whatever they do. They will rehearse the course. Now, or they re rehearse the act enough times that the, once they can concept the whole thing to its completion and they get out of that think box, then the think box is so important because we have to review our act. We have to repeat it enough times. And the act of mental rehearsal really installs the neurological hardware in your brain. It primes the brain for so you have circuits to use. Now, Mental rehearsal also changes the body. You can take a group of men uh, and have them imagine or rehearse doing bicep curls for an hour a day for two weeks and add an emotional component called stronger, harder, more intense. And for one hour, they practice in their mind doing those, those curls. At the end of two weeks, there's a 13.5 increase in muscle strength. They never lifted a weight. Their body's changing by thought alone. So the person who's priming their brain and body through rehearsal, when they get in their play box, there's no thinking. Mm. <laughs> there's just doing. There's just the act. In fact, the thought of what they're doing becomes the experience. They get lost in the act and their analytical facilities, their, their analytical mind is out of the way and they can, they can sustain a state where nothing in their environment is going to move them from this state. They're in the feeling of what it would feel like to play well and they hold on to that feeling. And when the conditions get tense, they actually do something different. They self-regulate and they actually crave this moment of performance to be able to produce an outcome. And so there's no mysticism to this. It's just what people do when they get really into something is that we rehearse all the time. So but people understand if you take a group of people that never played the piano before and you teach them one-handed scales and chords and they come and practice for two hours a day for five days at the end of five days if you do a brain scan before and after they'll grow circuits on the opposite side of the brain no magic there you learn something new learning's making new connections you get your body involved you get some instruction mm -hmm. you have an experience experience enriches the circuits repeat it over and over again fire and wire and pay attention and stay present you'll assemble new neural neurological uh, circuitry. Take another group of people, have them close their eyes and act, actually have them mentally rehearse playing the scales and chords for two hours a day for five days, scan their brain before and after. And at the end of five days, their brain will look like they've been playing the piano for five days, but they never lifted a finger. The brain mm. literally changed through the rehearsal. Okay. So now take the person and put them in front of a piano, They've never played the piano before. And they could actually play those scales and chords like the people who are actually physically demonstrating it. So what does that have to do for the single mother of three children? What does that have to do with the person 
who's trying to heal a health condition. It's not enough to just have a good meditation and get up and spend the rest of your day reacting and responding to the conditions in your life. That's one hour of living or conditioning your body and brain into the future against 15 hours of you responding emotionally from your mm. past. So we got to rehearse, okay, how am I going to be in this situation? How am I going to change? What would love do today? What would greatness look like? It's, the, it's those frontal lobe questions that actually begins to install the circuitry and we all do it naturally. The only time we don't do it is when we're living in stress and we're living in survival. Why? Because it's not a time to create. It's not a time to learn. It's not a time to go inward. Uh, it's not, and not a time to dream. It's yeah. a time to run, fight and hide. And if you're spending the majority of your time in the arousal of those stress hormones, then most people then their senses become heightened, they narrow their focus, and now they're engaged in, in doing anything they can, relying on something outside of them to take away that feeling. So if, a pe if people begin to understand that they actually can change, and there's a f they understand a formula to do it, and they practice that formula, and they rehearse it, both by mentally rehearsing it and actually participating in it, the effects should be in the experiment that something should change either in your body or in your life. And that's why we do it. So when you see the changes or the synchronicities or the coincidences or the opportunities starting to show up in your life, you're going to pay attention to what you did and you're going to do it again. And many people who have chronic health conditions that just get beyond those thoughts and those habits and those emotions that keep them as that same personality and begin to think, act, and feel differently, notice dramatic changes in their, in their health and in their biology. And we have the data to suggest that people who do this for seven days, their body looks like genetically and biologically, they're in a different life. Yeah. <laughs> their body is no longer responding in the same way, and they're no longer victims to their environment because they can self-regulate. There tends to be a greater resistance yeah. uh, to anything in their environment, even on a microscopic level. A lot of this is a complete paradigm shift for the current way most of society is and the way modern society is kind of taught, whether it be at school or university. Um, you know, we, we talk, if I talk through the lens of a medical doctor and looking at the health of my patients, for many years, I have said that, listen, you know, we're missing lots of key skills as medical doctors because, you know, what, we, what we've learned can be really good for acute problems and, and emergency situations, but it doesn't tend to work so well for these chronic conditions that didn't happen overnight that they have developed because of our lifestyle. And I've said many times in the media over the last few years that about 80% of what we see is in some way connected to our collective modern lifestyles. You know, I'm not putting blame on people. I'm just saying it's the way we are living these days is leading to not just things like obesity, type 2 diabetes, but also anxiety, depression, migraines, uh, gut problems, low libido, whatever this barrage of problems we're now seeing as doctors is. But I've got to say, um, over the last few years, I've been wondering, well, yes, I still maintain that's that's the case. And I still want to make and help people make those lifestyle changes. But actually, I've realized it's not the root cause. It's not, I can go further upstream. Yes, lifestyle is important. If I can help people change, yes, it changes their downstream um, consequences on their health. But the way we think our mental well-being, our happiness. I have actually come to the conclusion over the last year, so that's even more important than lifestyle because if we change the way we think and approach the world and respond to people and external events rather than, you know, unconsciously reacting, well, that creates a new environment in our body where we naturally make better lifestyle choices. In fact, those lifestyle choices no longer feel like an effort because a lot of the time, those lifestyle behaviors are simply a way for us to manage the stress in our lives. Would you sort of, I mean, how would you see that? Do you, do you agree with that? Do you have a different perspective? I'm just very, very interested to hear, hear your thoughts. No, no, I, I, I absolutely agree with it. I, I absolutely do. And, and I just think, I think that um, the one thing, if it took you five years 
of living in chronic stress and living and what are the emotions of stress and survival aggression anger hatred um competition judgment insecurity envy jealousy pain suffering guilt shame fear anxiety depression hopelessness powerlessness those are all derived from the hormones of stress and psychology calls the normal human states of consciousness those are altered states of consciousness and so then if you're living in emergency and your response to your coworker, to your boss to the traffic to the news to whatever it is weakens the organism and you're switching on that emergency mm. system over time. No organism can live in emergency mode for an extended period of time. You're, you're drawing from the body's vital resources and you're converting all of its energy into chemistry for some threat real or imagined. Okay, so then if you keep doing that in chronic conditions, there's no energy for growth and repair. There's no energy for long-term building projects. The, the immune system dials down. The digestive system becomes out of phase. Hormones change. Uh, um, our cardiovascular system changes. Our respiratory system changes. This is because the, the body is believing it's living in a dangerous environment, okay? So the problem then becomes that the arousal of these stress hormones that create fear, that create anger, aggression, or create pain give the body a rush of energy now people become almost like an addict they they need the problems in their life to reaffirm their addiction to that arousal to that emotion yeah <laughs> and now if you can turn that response on by thought alone number one you become addicted to your own thoughts and number two you become addicted to the the very life the, the life that you don't even like <laughs> yeah. So then you ask the person, why are you this way? And they'll say, I am this way because of this event that happened to me five years ago. Well, yeah. what that really means is they had some really profoundly uh, emotional experience. And the stronger the emotion we feel, the more altered we feel inside of us, the more we pay attention to what causes it. And the brain freezes a frame and takes a snapshot. And that's called the long term memory. And so then that person then is altered biologically from that trauma, from that event. And what they don't know is every time they remember the event, they're producing the same chemistry in their brain and body as yeah. if the event was occurring. Okay, well, then you tell the person, why are you this way? Well, then they'll tell the story about how it happened and the research on memory says that 50% of that story, the way you recount it, is actually not accurate. It's actually not the truth. Mm. That people don't have the same brain, so they embellish the story to excuse themselves from changing. And if they make it more difficult or they, they add more components to it, then now they'll reaffirm their identity in being a certain way. Yeah. That story becomes very important to them. And they believe it, they behave it, as it and they ultimately become it and so then can you use those same yeah. principles and begin to start to manage your inner world and by regulating taking the time before you start your day and say okay before i grab my cell phone before i get up and run through my routine you know my automatic routine where people's are on automatic pilot and a, a habituation of what they did yesterday and their body's dragging them into the same predictable future based on what they did in the past and they've lost their free will to mm. choose to become conscious to a set of automatic programs well if the familiar past is the known and the predictable future is the known there's only one place where the unknown yeah. exists and that's the sweet spot of the present moment so if you said okay let me get present here let me remind myself of those thoughts i don't want to think let me remind myself of the behaviors I want to change. Let me review in my mind the emotions that caused me to move to a lower denominator. Let me become so conscious of that that I won't go unconscious again. Let me remind myself who I do want to be, how I do want to think, how I do want to act, how I do want to feel. And let me see if I can get so good at doing this with my eyes closed when I start my day that I can do it with my eyes open. Now, mm. this 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 river of change, you know, people say, I can't predict my future. Well, the best way to predict it is to create it, not in the known, but in the unknown. So our research shows that if you teach a person 
to go a little further than where they normally stop. You know, when they get uncomfortable, they, they quit and reach for their cell phone or they say, I'm busy, got too much to do. If you get people present, really, and you teach them how to stretch a little further uh, and they get beyond that known and there's no danger, there's no threat, there's no survival, the body actually begins to relax into the present moment. Yeah. And when that happens, we see this over and over again, energy moves right into the heart. And now the heart all of a sudden starts to beat with more order, more coherence. The autonomic nervous system mm. is no longer dysregulated from stress. It's starting to organize and this feeling feels right, right? So then if you can sustain that state, independent of the conditions in your, your environment, then you're mastering your environment, you're mastering your life. Yeah. The response most of the times, if you don't change your response to the conditions in your life, then nothing will change, including yeah. you. So, so uh, in chronic stress, then the person who's living in chronic stress, they're mismanaging their attention because when you're in stress, stress is created by, you can't predict something, uh, you've lost control, or you have the perception that something's getting worse. And so look at, look at the world we live in right mm -hmm. now. People are in chronic stress. They don't know that, but now they need the arousal to wake them up, and then they need something outside of them, their cell phone, yeah. a, a TV, whatever it is, a movie, a drug or drink, whatever it is to make that feeling go away. And once you notice the change in that internal state, you pay attention to what caused it. And now you're more reliant on the outer yeah. environment. So then is it possible then to teach a person then to create more coherence in their brain and heart? And we have data to suggest yeah. that you could change your brain in four days and make it work better. You can make your heart, you can trade resentment, impatience, frustration for elevated emotions and train people how to create more coherence in their heart. The side effect of that, doing that every day, we've done the research, will strengthen your immune system up to 50%. Why? Because your response isn't weakening you. You're not mm. victim to your environment. Yeah. So if you're not victim to your environment, then you're less susceptible to anything in your environment, large or small or tiny or microbes or whatever. Yeah. So then when the person understands that, then they say, oh my God, this hatred, this fear, this anger that I've become so accustomed to. I literally have to change that. And when we do, you have to understand that the body's going to crave the familiar feelings because that's mm -hmm. what it's used to. And this is, this is the work. And people come to our work and they say, I think I'm doing my meditation wrong because their body's getting aroused and they're getting frustrated. I say, no, 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 no. You're actually doing it right. So now instead of reaching for your cell phone, we'll give you something to do. Settle your body back down from that emotional state. Yeah. Tell it it's no longer the mind that you're, you're the mind, and that's a victory. Then the person goes, I don't like this feeling. I don't know what I'm doing. I want to get up. I want to quit. I want to go eat. I want to, when's this end? And they become conscious. Their body wants to move into the predictable future. And now they're gonna execute a will that's greater than the program and return the body back to the present moment. That's a victory also. And if we keep doing this over and over again, and you know, the stronger the emotions we feel, yeah. the more we pay attention to it. So, so every problem, every person in your life that you have an emotion associated with, you give them your attention. So as you lower the volume to your emotions, you take your attention off your, your personal life. And, 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 the only way you're going to change your personal reality then is to get beyond your personality. And the only way you're going to change your personal reality is to get beyond your memory yeah. of all the associations to your personal reality. And if you're going to heal your body, you got to get beyond your body. So you got to get beyond its habituations. You got to get beyond its emotional responses. And you got to tell the body it's no longer the mind, that you're the mind. And, the, and the, in the beginning, it's tedious, but working with your body like training yeah. an animal. There, we notice that there's a liberation of energy and the person then who goes a little further uh, than they normally go, instead of reaching for their cell phone or posting something on social media, they're gonna stick with it and be curious. What's on the other side mm. of this limited thought? What's on the other side of this familiar emotion? Yeah. What's on the other side of this complaining and, and judging and analyzing? What's on, the, what's on the other side of it? Now, 
there's not a lot of agreement in society that says, Rangan, you have to sit with yourself and, and, be, and to know thyself, to become so conscious of those unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that I won't go unconscious again. And we found out that it's the overcoming process that is the becoming process. And people continue to overcome, 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 and then they become that other person yeah. biologically. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this, watching it right now, will be thinking, hey, good for you, mate. You went off to be a monk. Uh, you went to India. You, uh, and we, we'll explore your story there for sure. But I'm busy. You know, I've got my kids to take care of. I'm holding down two jobs. You know, I don't have time to think like a monk. And so if somebody is skeptical and is thinking that at the moment, what would you say to them? First of all, I'd say if that's how you feel, then you are completely entitled to your opinion and I respect it. Uh, I, I genuinely have no desire to want to convince anyone to try a new thing out or a new method that they have very little time for or don't fill the space for. But even if there's a glimpse of an opening in your mind, even if there's a tiny little bit of curiosity where you're like, I know I don't have time, but I, I think there could be something in this. Well, well, then this is what I'd say to you. I'd say that we will continue to create the life that we currently have with the current set of thoughts, wisdom, beliefs, and ideas that we have. And if we're happy on that path, if you could fast forward your life in 10, 20, 30 years time, and you'd be satisfied with getting the life that you have right now, then that's great. But if like the majority of people that I know and that I speak to and that I connect with online, the majority of us would look and go, no, I really want to change life. I want to be with my kids, but I want to change how I am with them. I want to be at work, but I want to be more present at work. I want to improve the quality of my life then I'd say that it's so important that we learn and open up our minds to alternative thoughts. I'll give you an example. There was this great study that MIT did on people's minds, openness, and their ability to be creative and innovative. And they looked at two types of people. One person was surrounded by people who all knew the same people, right? Kind of like our normal lives. And the other person was surrounded by lots of people who didn't know each other. And they did the study around who is more creative, more innovative, and has a bigger impact in the workplace, in their professional life, and then a little bit into their personal life as well. And what they found was that those people who knew people, who knew each other, who knew them back, lived in what was known as echo chambers. They were rarely exposed to ideas that improved their way of living or their professional performance. But people who were exposed to ideas that had no connection with other people in their life were able to be more creative, have better ideas, have more purpose, have more meaning in life. So often we've become closed in our little spaces around what we hear, what we know about, and we're not exposed to this new sense of ideas. And that's what I would encourage is just approach it with a tiny bit of curiosity, that's all you need. Yeah, so beautifully put. Uh, and I'd absolutely wholeheartedly agree with that, support that. I think I think the tools in your book, frankly, will help anyone. There's tools in there that are going to help me. There's tools in there that will help someone in a different role, a different state of life. Because I think there's a lot of universal themes there. Uh, and I really want to explore and talk about some practical things throughout this conversation, Jay. But, you know... I'm, I'm interested that many people have a crisis in their life from time to time. It might be a, I don't know, midlife crisis, a quarter life crisis. And, you know, they may go away for a weekend. They may go and buy a new car. But you had a form of crisis and you went off to be a monk in India, right? So I'd love to understand what happened there. You know, what led you to that? Um, because I think to a lot of people... I wouldn't say it was, it's extreme, but it's going all in, right? And um, it, it's fantastic because I don't think until I met you, I don't think I've ever met a monk before. <laughs> so, you know, maybe you could expand on what happened there. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to say something, Ranga, that from your earlier question of, you know, the real premise or the real foundation of this book is that you don't need to live like a monk to think like a monk. 
what I've done is I've taken the lessons and the principles and all the teachings that I had and made them really relevant and practical for modern life. So you don't have to go and do the journey that I did in order to learn some of these. Now, my journey was definitely from a place of curiosity and it started off not with a sense of pain or stress or pressure in my personal life because I was fairly young at the time and of course I'd been exposed to the different things you do growing up in a family and normal challenges growing up. But really what it was for me is I was surrounded by a lot of friends that were older than me. Sorry to interrupt. If you're enjoying this video and you want to learn more, then do check out my free special guide, which contains the six crucial steps you need to take in your life to not only build healthy habits, but also to make them stick. If you want to get hold of this free guide, all you have to do is click on the link in the description box below. And my friends were sometimes two years older, some of them were five years older, some of them were getting married, some of them had great jobs, some of them were making good money. And it's really interesting that they were really honest with me. And they would open up and say to me, Jay, you know what, I've, I've got this perfect partner, I've got this perfect job, I've got this perfect situation, but I'm still not happy. And I'd be sitting there as a young teenager going, how can you not be happy? I mean, you know, you've got a beautiful partner, you're making good money, you drive a nice car, you have a nice home. How is it that you're not satisfied? And it was so interesting to me to be exposed to a group of people that I thought had it all, but felt like they didn't have anything. And then when I was invited to hear a monk speak, and I was fascinated at the time by hearing CEOs, entrepreneurs, athletes, my two first books that I ever read were David Beckham's autobiography and Dwayne The Rock Johnson's autobiography when he was still in the WWF and the WWE. And, and I was fascinated by rags to riches stories and people who went from nothing to something. And then I was invited to hear a monk speak and I genuinely had this complete dismissive demeanor about what monks could teach me. And my approach was, well, what am I going to learn from a monk? How to sit still? What has a monk even achieved? And so when I went to hear this monk speak, I went there with no expectations. But the amazing thing is that I found that someone who had nothing actually had everything. He had contentment. He had satisfaction. He exuded it and when he spoke, he spoke with such compassion and empathy. And I thought, I've never heard any of my friends speak like this. I've never experienced someone have this. And now when I reflect back, I realize very clearly that when I was 18, I'd met people who were rich. I'd met people who were beautiful and stunning and attractive. I'd met people who were famous and successful. I'd met people who were really smart and intellectual. But I don't think I'd ever met anyone who was truly happy. And even if you reflect in your own life, anyone who's listening or watching right now, just think about it for a moment. Who in your life would you genuinely say you believe is content and happy and joyful? I'm guessing you probably count them on your hand. And for me, that monk was the first person that I met that really exuded that and I wanted to learn more. So for me, it wasn't about being in a major life crisis. It wasn't about things not working out. It was from the perspective of learning through the challenges of my friends who were thankfully so honest with me that helped me question what I thought life was all about. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Jay, because, you know, as you, you, as you sort of describe that, I think many of us, I know I have throughout my life, um, looked at various parameters of success you know, when, when you're a kid growing up, you know, what you're surrounded by influences so much of what you think is possible in the world. And I've, you know, I said this before, and as, as, a, as a sort of fellow um, Indian sort of the child of an Indian immigrant family in the UK, uh, you know, you know, the certain pressures and the certain expectations that often come with that. And, you know, if I'm honest, I've often reflected back on this. And I say to people, you know, because being a doctor is deemed, you know, by society as a successful career choice. But I say to people, you know what? Yeah, they say, well, you're so lucky. You so this, and I, I am lucky. But really, I, I was influenced by my childhood. I was influenced by my upbringing because all my parents' friends were doctors. So all the adults I knew pretty much growing up, apart from my school teachers, 
were doctors. So therefore it was an, you know, for me, it was a natural progression to then become a doctor. But I will tell you this, um, as I become more in tune with what makes people happy, with what makes me happy, honestly, if I look around in the medical profession, I see a lot of unhappy people. I see a lot of people doing what they thought they should do, what society has told them is going to make them happy, what their parents have told them is going to make them happy. Um, and they're doing it. And they may be making reasonable money. And as you say, have the house and have the car. But often underneath that, there's a feeling of discontentment. And, you know, I, I've been realizing this in my probably 30s, late 30s. But you, I guess, would you, in some ways, to experience it, I think you're in your teens, right? I'm 18, was I was it? 18 years old when I first had that interaction I just explained. Yeah, because, I mean, I wonder if you sort of think back and that is clearly a significant fork in the road for you because had you not, do you ever think back, what would have <laughs> happened had I not gone to that talk? I have thought about that a lot. <laughs> and and I think we should, I think we should reflect on life like that. It really makes you grateful. And I always look back at that day as a very humbling day because, you know, I went there with my egotistic, arrogant 18 year old nature of what am I going to learn from this guy and then obviously that becomes the best decision of my life. And so life's humbling in that way, right? Like I don't look back at that day and go, oh, I made the best decision and I'm such an amazing person. I look back and go, wow, I was so, so arrogant and did not realize how much I could learn from this individual. And it, it's almost like this ironic moment. But I think about it all the time. I think if I didn't go that day or I didn't meet monks or I didn't meet people who are trying to live on a higher frequency or a higher vibration, I believe that, I would have ended up chasing all the normal things that I was chasing in terms of stability, security. I probably would have had a comfortable job and done just okay. And, you know, life would have been fine. But I really feel that the life I get to live today, which is a life of service and purpose and meaning, is what I would have missed out on. And there are so many times in my life where I wonder what life would have been like. And, and I'm just grateful that I met the right people at the right time. And this is really what this book is about, that the reason why I called it Think Like a Monk and the reason why I've gone into the depth around the wisdom and the practices that I have is we don't realize how much we're not experiencing in life. Like you said, we all grow up in this bubble. Like if you grew up in where I grew up, North London, it's a very specific bubble. And then if you grew up in England, it's a very specific bubble. And then you grow up in the United States, in New York, or LA, it's a bubble. And we live in these bubbles. And the challenge with a bubble is that you never really understand if there's something out there that could change your experience of life. And for me, it's so random to have met a monk at 18. Like you said, you, you've never you know, experienced or met a monk before. And I'm, I'm not a monk anymore, so you still haven't met a monk. We have to find Rung and someone for you <laughs> to meet. But, but you know, it's that point of just, what is it in the world that we haven't experienced that could expand our mind and take us on a different journey? And I think that's the goal is you may not need a monk in your life, but who or what or which idea is it in your life that you haven't yet let in? Yeah. And I think what you speak to there is the importance of staying curious mm -hmm. and keeping somewhat of an open mind. And I think that is something that we see across society now that I think is becoming in incredibly problematic where people are stuck in their little silos and, you know, they don't look beyond that. So they're very quick to judge other people who have a different view. They're very quick to sort of shut people down unless it fits with their narrative. And I think really what I'm hearing from you is staying curious, staying open-minded, looking listening to other people's ideas. It's like you said at the start, right? You're mm -hmm. not trying to persuade anyone to do anything, but if you're a bit curious, maybe there's an idea that someone's going to hear throughout this conversation that just sparks something for, for them. Very much like, I guess, you had uh, when you were 18. Uh, Jay, I think one of the first times I came across you was a few years back. I heard you on an interview. So I can't remember what the interview was, but I remember being really impacted by what you said and thinking, who is this guy? I mean, this is pretty incredible what I heard. And it was, it wasn't one of your videos that you were talking a lot about, I think, identity. 
And I think it was something about, it really got me thinking about what is my identity? I guess I was on a journey then anyway, since I lost my father about, what, seven years ago now. I think that was the one of the significant moments in my life that got me to start questioning everything, thinking about, well, who am I? You know, am I living my life or am I living somebody else's life? I think you expressed it so beautifully. But then when I read your book, I think you start off very early on with identity. So I wonder if you could expand on identity. What is it and why do you think many of us need to spend a bit of time thinking about it? Yeah, so I, I think I know exactly which interview you're talking about and, and what I say in it. The, the monks start with identity and at the root of the issue because a lot of what we experience in the world today, as you know, and, and I know how holistic you are in the way you advise your patients when you were speaking on my podcast, I was so impressed by you and how you're able to tie in so many psychological and natural practices and relational exercises that can improve people's health and well-being overall. I remember you talking about encouraging your clients to see more friends as a way of uh, changing the way they feel. And I was thinking, wow, this person's got so many great ideas. And the reason is because, Rangan, you also have that monk mindset of you go to the root of the issue. It's really easy to just say, oh, well, just take two of these a day or try this or, you know, maybe you need to do this. But when you think about it from the root perspective, where do our challenges arise? And our challenges arise by how we see ourselves. And what I believe Rangan's referring to is there's this quote that I begin my book with and that I've shared in interviews for the last few years. And it's from a writer named Charles Horton Cooley who wrote this in the 1900s. And what he said is that, sorry, I think it's in the 1800s, at the end of the 1800s, towards the 1900s. And he said, and, and bear with me, and you've got to really listen closely to this. So what he said that the challenge today is I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. Now, just let that blow your mind for a moment. I will explain it, I promise. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am, which means we live in a perception of a perception of ourselves. So I'll break it down. If I think, Rangan thinks I'm smart, I'll say I feel smart. But if I think Rangan thinks I'm not smart, then I'll say I'm not smart. And so the challenge is that we're basing how we feel about ourselves on what we think someone thinks of us. And, and the greatest challenge with that is, how do you have any idea if what you think someone thinks about you is even true and whether that's even the best place to start? So that's where our identity struggles. We start pursuing things in life because we think other people value them. It's almost like, let's think of the most playground version of this. If I remember wearing high-tech shoes from BHS to the <laughs> playground, right? I remember my mom, because my parents didn't buy me Nike uh, trainers uh, or Adidas trainers, which I always wanted. You know, we didn't come from that background. I, I couldn't, couldn't afford them and my parents didn't want to, me to have them. So I'd walk in with my high-tech Trainers from BHS, they were about 10 quid or whatever they were. <laughs> and, 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 you know, to me, it didn't make a difference. I didn't really know at that time whether high tech was good or bad. They were just trainers that my parents bought me. Now, everyone, the cool kid at school had the latest Nike trainers. All of a sudden, I start thinking that he's now surrounded by everyone. Everyone's talking about his trainers. Everyone's giving him adoration. Everyone's giving him respect. Everyone's talking about his trainers. So now I think that if I want to have that same experience and love from people, that I need to get that. Not realizing that I may be able to get deeper love from people by being kind and compassionate. That I may actually be able to build a real relationship with people if I'm loving and, and considerate and empathetic. And it's so crazy how your life can become about pursuing something. And that's why Jim Carrey puts it best, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, you know, everyone in the world should achieve everything they've ever wanted and accomplish everything they've ever pursued just to realize that it's not the point. Now, that doesn't mean the monk mindset is not about not pursuing your goals. It's actually about pursuing your truest goals, your truest self and your most authentic aligned goals. So it's not about not having goals. It's about making sure that your goals are actually yours. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, 
I get shivers when you say that coolie quotes. Oh, me too, man. And, actually, and I think I've had a, I've had a flashback. I think I can't say for sure where I was when I heard that interview, but I think I was on a train from Manchester to London or London back to Manchester. And I think I pressed pause and I think I wrote it in my notes. I think I'm pretty sure I wrote it and I, I rewound it. I played it again. I thought, hold on, I've got the first part, <laughs> the second part. What, what's that third part? And I really had to sit with it for a while. And I would urge people if they need to press pause right now, <laughs> listen to it and really think about it. And I think, you know, it's really interesting, you know, hearing that. And I reflect on my children who... I know you had a, a very brief, lovely conversation with just before we started. I might put that in at the end of the podcast, Please maybe. Please do, it was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think about this as they go through school and, you know, they start to see what other people have got. And, you know, um, we, my wife and I, were very keen to try and not put value on those things because... I know I also had experiences like that when I'd say, oh God, man, they're wearing those things. I want to wear those because if I wear them, I'm going to be happy. Uh, I saw a, maybe a year ago or so, I saw a Gary Vaynerchuk video online when he was um, telling someone at one of his conferences, he was, you know, he, he was talking about a BMW and he basically said to the guy in his, in, in, you know, in, in his <laughs> inimitable way, which is wonderful, um, that I think you own a BMW because of what other people will think of you when you drive that BMW. And the guy literally, you know, in, in that clip, he just sort of sat with it and he, he said, yeah, I do. I mean, it's what it symbolized is to, to people around him. And again, I'm not having to go at anyone who, who might be doing that. You know, we all do things at, at, at times to get that um, that validation or what we think is a validation from people around them. But I think what you're trying to get at is how do we find our own identity? How do we live our own lives? So, so Jay, how do we do that? If we spent a lifetime living someone else's life, how do we in our 30s or our 20s or our 40s or our 50s, how do we just decide, oh, I'm going to start finding out what my life is? Yes, absolutely. And, and, and I love the tone you're sharing this in, Rangan, because my tone's the same. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not coming at this from a point of view of, you know, we're wasting our lives or I've got it figured out. Like, I, I don't want to make this about you not getting your goals or not having pursuits or not wanting to become something because I want to do all those things too. But it's about why you're doing it. And it's also about making sure they're truly motivated by your inner desire, right? Like that's the point. It's like, if you want to drive a BMW, drive a BMW because that's the car you love. Don't drive it because you think. Uh, if you want to be a doctor, become a doctor because you think that's how you're gonna serve humanity, not because you think people will be impressed. If you want to go to Harvard or Princeton or Oxford or Cambridge, go there because you really want to study how to solve the world's problems, not because you think it looks good on your resume. Right. That's the point that we're going after. So thank you, Rangan, for like recentering that, that tonal piece. And I, I appreciate it. But so where do we start? One of my favorite ways to start is looking at what we value. And values are a very intangible word. And so there's a very easy way to figure out what you value. There's two things you have to look at. You look at how you spend your money, the most painful thing you can poss possibly do, go through your bank statement and look at where your money is being spent. That is what you value. The other thing that we spend, just like we spend money, is how we spend our time. Those are the two most perfect ways to see what you currently value. Your value isn't what's in your head, isn't what's in your heart, it isn't what's in your mind, it's how you spend your money and how you spend your time. And so, just to give you an overview, and I share this in the book, that research was done on how we spend our time, and the research showed that we spend 33 years in bed, right? 33 years of our life in bed. And seven years of that is spent trying to sleep, not even sleeping, right? We spend one year and four months exercising across our whole lives, these are, by the way. We spend more than three years on vacation. Uh, and we spend a bunch of days trying to get ready. And we spend a bunch of time, you know, standing in lines and queues and so much of our time just gets spent. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, 
Where am I currently spending my time? And where do I want to spend it? Now, studies also show that people, everyone has to go to work. So this isn't about what you do for work. People who had more meaningful, purposeful lives and were healthier, wealthier, and wise invested their time in education over entertainment. And Rangan, your, your audience is lucky because they get education and entertainment in one place. But, but that's the goal, right? Like that's the goal that you're creating an opportunity for people to find education. The, the smartest, the wealthiest, the most healthiest, the wisest people in the world were reading books, watching documentaries, taking courses, listening to podcasts, learning to better themselves. And so that's the first place to start. The second place, when we look at that value audit, is I want you to write down three things that you're currently pursuing in life. It might be a promotion, it might be a new home, whatever it is, whatever it is that you are currently pursuing. And then I want you to ask this question. Is that your desire and your dream? Or is it coming from something outside of you? Is it coming from a pressure of a family member? Is it coming from an expectation because your friend just bought something? Where is that desire truly coming from? And the third and final question you want to ask yourself is, do I still want to pursue that? Or do I want to change how I pursue it? Or do I not want to pursue it at all? And if you go through that three-step questioning process, you'll get to the truth of what you truly want to pursue and stop yourselves from building a sandcastle which the waves of time will eventually wash away. And so that's yeah. what we get lost doing. We get lost building castles that we don't even want to live in. Yeah. It's so profound. And, you know, I really think that there's something unique about the times in which we live now there really is this dissatisfaction this lack of contentment you know you put it so beautifully at the start of this conversation i don't know if you've seen the documentary minimalism I haven't um, actually, you know. or not which i think you'd absolutely love it i i really really enjoy it i've seen it a couple of times i've watched it with my kids again recently but again it's these two guys in their 30s who you know They've got success by society's definition. They've got the job, they're earning good money, you know, but there's a hole inside. There's a, a feeling of, is this all there is to life? And so I, I really think you, you're tapping on something that is that is really out there at the moment. And really, if people can get their heads around this, I think it can transform their own lives, but also transform the lives of the people around them, which I think is really, really exciting. Now, you call it a value audit. Now, I thought that word was really interesting because I have been sort of, I, I, had, I had sort of nearly three weeks off social media until two days ago. Like I, I didn't post, I went off, I made a thing of it, and I found that I, I found it a lot easier to go inward in my life. It was just one thing to switch off a bit of noise for me that I, I'm not saying everyone has to do this. It's just something I personally find useful. And I also like to... I think it's a nice example to set to people that you can do it uh, if you want to. But what was really interesting is I've been doing a values exercise with myself. I've been trying to write down five core values that I want to live my life by. And it really struck me that a lot of people, and I would probably include myself in this, have got an idea of what we think our values are. But unless we actually go and audit the process of what are we spending our time and money doing, we have no idea if we really are living those values. So I really like the term audit because it's not your perception of how you think you're actually spending your money or spending your time. It's the reality of it. And, and I think it's something that I haven't done it. And I think, I think I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to actually see <laughs> Oh, is it aligned with what you say you stand for? Are you actually spending time like that? So is this a common thing, do you think, for people that they have a, there's a, there is a gap between their desired values and their actual values? I genuinely believe, first of all, Rangan, thank you for sharing that too. And I, I genuinely believe that people are well-intentioned and want to do good in the world. I believe that. I believe that people have a good heart, they're smarter than we think they are. They want to do good in the world and they want to put out good energy. But you're exactly right that that intention needs to be converted and transferred into real behavior. And this is where you'll find, you know, you'll hear a friend or someone you know say, oh, you know, I really value loyalty. 
and, and I really don't like gossip. And then you find out that that person was gossiping about you. And how does that feel? It, it completely feels like someone's broken your trust. And so often the way we see ourselves or want to see ourselves is amplified compared to how we actually behave. So we'll spot something. And there's a, there's a beautiful story that I share in the book. And, and there's lots of these across the book. Uh, but there's these, there's these old ancient Indian and Zen stories. And there's this story of the evil king that goes to meet a good king. So the evil king goes to the, the castle, the quarters of the good king. And the good king, being a good king, invites the evil king inside for some dinner. They sit down. The servers bring out the plates. The plates are placed in front of the evil king and the good king. And they're just about to eat. And as just about as they're about to eat, the evil king switches the plates. And, and the good king goes, what's going on? Like, is that some ceremony in your time? Like, look, why are we doing this? And the evil king goes, well, I don't know. You might have poisoned my food. You, you might be trying to kill me. You might have poisoned it. And the good king just bursts out laughing. He's just like, really? Like, come on. This, like, I've invited you over for dinner. Like, this is my team like you know whatever it is like let, let's start eating right now and just about as he's about to eat the evil king swaps it back again and the good king goes well now what then and he goes well I don't know you might be double bluffing me and that night the evil king doesn't eat the good king happily eats his plate the point is that so often we think we don't have some of the mistakes that we make but we see them in everyone else. We see those mistakes in other people. So we'll say, oh, this person's not doing this right, or I don't like the way he or she talked to that person. But if we really do an audit in ourselves, we'll realize that we have a lot of those same challenges and feelings that we may think others have. And so for me, it's sometimes a really scary and daunting task to do that values audit, but it truly, truly is a, a beautiful process that we all need to go through to really realign our map and get our compass right and start moving in the right direction. I mean, is it the sort of thing that people do once or is it the sort of thing that people should revisit? And I guess, you know, if I was to ask you, when was the last time you did that exercise on yourself? Yeah, great question. So I'd say that you have to revisit like gardening. If you look at your garden outside and I can see a bit, I can see a light little okay. glimpse of Rangan's garden. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you have a garden, how often do you have to garden? Maybe you mow the lawn, I don't know, once a week, once a month. I don't know, yeah. you know, whatever, whatever well, you. Yeah, I'd say once a week, once probably. A week. I, li I like a nice, you know, shortish lawn. I don't like it when it gets too long. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go, once a week. And so I'd say that you have to treat this exercise like gardening because when you do a values audit, what you're really doing is gardening your values. And what that means is you're pulling out the weeds and you're planting new seeds. That's really the activity that's happening here. You're planting seeds in your mind, values that are good values, that are going to grow into fruits and trees and give shade to others and help other people. Or if you don't garden once a month, let's say Rangan leaves his he doesn't bother for the last six months during COVID. He just lets it be there. What's going to happen? That garden's going to be full of weeds. It's going to be full of yeah. stuff that he doesn't want there, right? It, it might attract bugs or other things that are there that he doesn't want. And that's what happens with our values, that after a while, our values start to attract dust. They start to attract uh, being covered over by so many other desires. So I would say it's a regular habit. I'd say that I do a refining values and intention exercise on myself about three times a week. I used to do it every day, but probably about three times a week. And I'm not saying anyone has to do it that often. I do it that often because I feel I live a life that is constantly moving, constantly challenging, and I'm presented with a lot of options and opportunities that I never imagined I'd have. And so I have to really train my mind to, to focus on these value audits. But I also know that every year I spend two or three year, two or three weeks and I go back to the monastery in India and I spend time in the ashram with monks. And so I feel this is both an activity that happens weekly or monthly. I'd say once a month. I, I'd say the best way is to treat it like your um, accounts and your taxes. Look at it every month. Look at your bank statement every month. And then once a year when you have to do your taxes and you're going through that tax return and getting it all right, you kind of do a deep dive on it. So I'd say if everyone yeah. could spend three days a year, five days a year going really deep, and then one hour a month, a couple of hours a month, 
that would be a great way to build it into your practice. Okay, I'm bothered about what other people think about me. I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm not going to be bothered anymore. No. It doesn't work like that, does it? No, because I still do care what people think about me, if I'm honest. You know, it's not like I've rid myself entirely. I'm just not willing to take it on as frequently and on the level that I used to. So I've found my own little comfort bubble now with doing the podcast and writing and other happy place projects we're doing where if people like the work, they'll find us. Yeah. I'm not being forced into people's homes via their TV or their radios so much anymore. If people like what I'm doing and it resonates, oh, brilliant. What a beautiful feeling. Please come and listen, watch whatever we're doing, take part in it if it's helpful. But I'm not... Sorry to interrupt. If you're enjoying this video and want to learn more, you can download my free special guide containing six simple breathing practices that will help you calm your mind, lower stress, and improve your energy. To get hold of this guide, all you have to do is click on the link in the description box below. There, for the sake of it. Um, people are choosing to people consume are choosing your to, content. Which is great. And it might be smaller. It might be on a, you know, less fireworky sort of level. But that, I'm comfortable with that. My nervous yeah. system is comfortable with that. And you know, occasionally you'll still get like a bit of an ego dent where I remember someone saying who I'd known in TV for a long time, um, from like way back when I was a teenager and they were like, Oh my God, what do you do these days? Do you work? And I was like, Oh, oh my God, I can work every day really hard. Like, I've never ever been so busy. And then I was like, why am I? I was like, yeah, I'm really happy. I'm doing loads of stuff that I love. Like you don't have to know about it. It's fine. But so I think you get the odd ego dent every now and again, and you just, brush it off and move on. But, you know, I still want people to like the work I'm doing, yeah. but I just, it, but because it's mine and I believe in it, there's less of a risk for me because if people don't like it, it's just not resonated. Yeah. Whereas when it was TV stuff I was doing before, it was more like, I just want to be perfect on the telly and for people to like me. It doesn't matter what I'm saying or if I believe in the subject matter. And that then hurts a lot more when people yeah. go, you're an idiot, you're annoying, or whatever it might be. I mean, of course, then a lot of people will see you and think, well, she's got it all, right? She's been on telly, she's presented a big Radio 1 show, she had a live lounge, all these incredible artists playing in front of her. Um, th there, there can be a perception sometimes, which is, I think it's so powerful the way you do share, not only in this book, but just in your work in general, your struggles. I think it is very, very... I don't know, it's refreshing. It, it's just a reassuring for people to go, oh, wow. Oh, even Fern's struggling with that. Like, it makes people feel better, I think, in some way that, oh, I'm not alone in my struggle. Because people do think, when I'm successful, when I've got that job, when I've got that pay rise, when I can afford a nicer car, I'm going to be happy. Yet we see countless examples of people in the public eye who have ticked off all those boxes. Yep. Yeah, are really, really struggling on the inside. Or at the worst, take their own life. We've we've seen this happen countless times. So we know that equation doesn't work. And I get it. I will look at shiny people in Hollywood and think, oh my God, they must have the most amazing. Like, I fall into that trap, yeah. of course. And it's all relative, isn't it? It is, but you know, and also I, I understand it because and also we have to be real here. If you're under the poverty line, yeah. of course having enough money to feed your kids, to have your heating on, to be able to get your kids to school, to get yourself to work is going to make a huge difference to your well-being. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not ignorant to that. But when we look at general happiness and feeling well, mentally, physically, whatever it is, having a nicer car or, you know, I could give a shit about cars. We've got like the crappiest car in the world, but Me too, whatever... you'll see when I give you a look to the station later, <laughs> you're like, really? He drives this? I could give a shit about cars. <laughs> I, honestly, mine's covered in kids' food and I couldn't give a crap. But whatever it might be or like, what but you clothes haven't got a, uh, you're wearing. But you haven't got a taped up wing mirror on the side there, have you? I don't have that. No. You well, have you beat me say... on that one. You beat me on that one. But I think, you know, if we even look at sort of women, you know, back in my 20s, I did used to feel judged on what I was wearing. Like this is a real shallow example, but I felt like I had to be ahead and like with the trends and what, you know, what designer would want to give me clothes or whatever. 
I mean, that to me, I can't even understand my own thinking on that one. I'm so far from it these days. But I thought if I looked a certain way, I would feel better. People would accept me more. People would see me as a shiny, brilliant person. You don't feel it inside still if you're going through stuff. Now I wear pretty much the same jeans every day. I wear trainers every day. I don't give a crap about all of that stuff because I know it doesn't work. That's a really silly, shallow example, but I think we can so easily look at people wearing designer clothes on the red carpet, la la la. Oh my God, being on a red carpet is probably one of the most excruciatingly awkward and pointless things ever, but we still celebrate all this stuff. And you know, as I said, I get it. I fall into that trap and, uh, and, and I understand it. Um, but what we can't do is confuse it with that stuff, keeping you safe from life happening. And when I say life happening, I mean, terrible situations coming into your life, yeah. whether it's loss or unexpected, awful things or whatever it is. You lost your cat yesterday. Mm. Sorry to hear that. Um, how are you doing? Um, yeah, I mean, it's been hard. It's, it sounds so silly when you don't have pets or animals in your life, I guess, to be that sort of hit by it. But it really floored me because, um, you know, I got, I've got two cats. One of them is still alive. And I got them when I was 20 from an animal home. And, um, you know, she's been with me through so much and moved all around London with me and, you know, seen me really, really happy, seen me in tears. Um, And I think when you lose them, you just feel that beautiful, innocent love has gone, which I don't think you get so often with humans in your life. You'll get that from, you know, people who you're very, very close to, but it's not a given with everyone in your life. But with animals, it's just the purest, most beautiful thing. So I'm absolutely heartbroken. I'm sorry to hear that. That sounds really tricky. Um, I've never had a pet. So I've heard people say that before, but I've never really experienced that myself. Mm. Um, So sorry for what you're going through. I appreciate you coming up and doing the podcast nonetheless. Yeah. Well, I Uh, thought, you know what? Because I felt really, really sad this morning, but I thought, you know, I know what your podcast is about and, and it's the sort of work that I'm trying to do and it's really honest work and it's deep work and actually it's probably really good for me to have a deep chat in this frame of mind because I think grief on whatever level just sort of strips layers away that need to go and it yeah. gets rid of the ego, it's really humbling. So I feel it's important to keep doing the work that I'm doing with whatever's going on. You know, I've certainly had that in the past going through all sorts of difficult things and and you end up working in a more authentic way, I think. So I think it's, you know, a good thing that I'm talking to you today. Well, I hope so. Um, it's interesting what you said about grief there. I've been reading your new book, Bigger Than Us. It's brilliant to read and there's a lot I want to unpack in the conversation today spirituality is a sort of key theme within it. And I was reflecting on my own life where spirituality came in for me. And it was probably through grief. You know, when my dad died, I think that was the first kind of big moment where I had to sort of take a look around me and ask myself really difficult questions. You know, whose life are you leading? You know, what's going on? What is the meaning of life? So I definitely resonate with that grief. Mm. Although you are in the very acute phases, uh, of course, but grief has that potential, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, I was thinking this yesterday um, when it happened and it's, you know, I was there when she passed away and I'd never seen a human or animal make that transition. I'd never witnessed death before. And um, I found it, you know, deeply sad and sort of shocking, but equally as sort of beautiful, I guess. And um, yeah, it felt, I guess, very special sort of being with her in that moment. And And I was already questioning so much, you know, last night about my own life and you know, like I waste so much time worrying about stupid shit that doesn't matter and caring about 
what other people think of me when, you know, the, the, the big, big thought for me last night was I'm spending all this time hoping that other people I don't know like me. I've got all the love that I need in these four walls. I don't need any more. I don't need any more. So that was a big one. Yeah. That's a lesson for all of us, isn't it? To reflect on that. Thank you for sharing that. I know it must be very, very tricky. Um, that sort of, as you, as you were saying that, Fern, you know, I have once been present to life extinguishing, certainly in the human form. Yeah. And I didn't realize, I, I wasn't spiritual at the time. I reflect through this podcast, actually, I think back, it was when dad died and I was in, it, dad had been ill for years and I was in a hospital room and my mum was on one side, I was on the other side and I was holding his right hand, mum was holding his left hand and literally it was for um, hours. For, you know, we knew this was coming, but you don't quite know when and it was probably for like 12, 14 hours sitting with dad and he was hooked up to monitors and stuff. So it was a very medical yeah. way of leaving but i remember as i reflect that man i sat with dad as he was breathing and living holding his hand as his blood pressure was dropping and as bit by bit mm. like the life is gone yeah and i remember my brother wasn't there i phoned him at home he got a taxi into manchester me mum and my brother we sat there for two hours well what f i don't know i didn't have a time on me <laughs> what what felt like two hours in the room around dad's dad's dead but we were chatting and it was such a calm mm. serene time mm. so yeah that that's my experience of yeah, it yeah it's it is so strange that you know you there's a living beautiful person animal whoever it is that has that meaning in your life and and that's there literally one second it's there and the next it's not it i don't think our human brains can we can understand it on you know perhaps a medical level a scientific level as to what's happening but on a deep meaningful level i don't know how we're meant to get our heads around it it's um it's too huge and um obviously i sort of thought about it a lot previously I, I, both my parents are alive so I haven't been through that level of grief yet um I lost my grandparents when I was relatively young so I remember the pain but I probably didn't have the sort of mindset that I do now I've lost friends more recently which has been really hard to get my head around um but yeah I think w with animals when you've had they're like part of the family and they're with yeah. you consistently so it has hit me really hard and I yeah I still haven't got my head around that moment of her sort of going and and it does bring up a lot of questions like well where has she gone you know I certainly believe that we're not just flesh and blood with a brain there's whether you want to call it consciousness or spirit or your soul I believe in that and I think without that I would feel quite bleak about the human experience that we're just all yeah. sacks of meat walking around with random things happening. I personally can't live in a world like that. I want to have a grasp and a belief in something bigger. Um, so I do wonder where her energy is now yeah. and where she's gone. And likewise with other people that I've lost in the past, it's, it's so, we don't have answers. No. And that's humbling because we've been tricked into believing that man knows everything and we have all the answers and we can figure out all the answers and it's a lie we don't know we don't have a clue i think that's what's so powerful about your book or one of the many things that you know the title bigger than us right yeah it's it it kind of says it all it's that connection to, to something beyond who we are, who we think we are. And, you know, as a doctor, I think this has been one of my frustrations with the profession in general. You know, I'm very proud to be a medical doctor, but I, but I think we're missing a big piece. Everything has been reduced down to blood results and scans and are you in the correct parameter? And, and that can have value sometimes. But if I really think about the transformations in health that I've witnessed over the past 20 years, 
a connection to something bigger than us is always part of the picture. Yeah, it's become essential for me because I guess I've been thrust into this <clears throat> world or whatever it is of well-being. I sometimes feel uncomfortable with that yeah. because it's used sometimes in a very beautiful way and other times in a warped way. Um, but to me, wellness is a full-bodied picture of, of course, you know, you've got to have a bit of all of it. You can't just have faith and hope without doing some practical things to look after yourself. But if you just do the practical, what's the point of it? So for me, you know, I say this in the book, I could drink all the wheatgrass, I could be, you know, covering myself in reishi mushrooms, whatever it might be. But if I don't have the other bit that is the connection and the belief and an, a mind that can expand beyond that, I don't feel well. Yeah. I don't feel well without that. So it's become, you know, an integral part of me feeling all right, mentally and physically. I love that section in the book. I think it, from recollection, I think it's at the start of the chapter about yoga and meditation. Mm. Is that right? <laughs> That's my favorite chapter. And I'll tell you why shortly. Um, but you start off that chapter with a question you know, you know, you sort of pose that question to the audience, to the reader, can you have true wellness without spirituality? And in, you know, your beautiful way, you, you know, you don't judge people that they may have a different view yeah. to you. You know, you really, I feel you really hold people's hands along as they're sort of reading, you know, your journey. But then you, you you're very clear in your view, which is you from my understanding of reading the book, it's that you cannot have full wellness without spirituality. Mm. That's the conclusion I've personally come to. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I talk about in the book can be used without that sort of thought process or belief or very visceral feeling um, at times. Fine, you know, if you just want to do yoga to keep fit, who am I to judge? You know, do what you want. Um, if you want to do meditation just so you're more focused at work, I, I don't care, you know, fine. But for me, I want to feel connected to something else. And I think going back to grief, because I'm sort of in it, um, it does that to you. And I remember having this conversation um, on my podcast with Ashley Kane, who had lost his daughter. And he talked so beautifully and honestly and eloquently about being in grief and that you do feel so connected to everything yeah. because you 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 have to be you're so aware of that transition and of that loss but also that beautiful love that you've been gifted and that you've experienced in life and I felt that last night sort of looking out my bedroom window and there was really clear night all the stars and I felt more connected than I have in months because of that profound thing that I just sort of witnessed so Without that, you've just got an animal or whatever your situation, a human, and they've stopped breathing. And that is, on a medical level, that's what's happened. But it's so much more than that. And if we've lost anyone in life, you know that. It's so much bigger than that. And I think we also get to put our own meaning on things. We get to choose how we do that, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter what someone else does. Nope. Choose the story that works for you. There was a... It's interesting, we're talking about this. I wasn't going to get to this till later, but I think towards the end of the book, you talk about nature and um, I think daffodils at some point mm. and how you really, we really feel that connection, don't we, when we're in nature. And I remember dad died right at the start of spring and it was about two in the morning. And by the time, you know, they'd come in the hostel, they'd taken the body. And by the time we'd got home, I got home, I think I saw Vid and the kids, and then I went to stay with mum. And I got into the drive in the house where I grew up, where mum still lives. And it was a, like the first or second day of spring, there were all of these daffodils that dad had planted. And at the time I just thought, oh, this is cool, you know, isn't it ace how, you know, dad's flowers are coming out. But now I think, oh, well, maybe there's something bigger there. You know, mm. maybe it was the universe or dad on some level just, you know, I, I don't know, you know, 
a it's real a, it's connection. It's hard to talk. It's hard to explain it because it is often very feeling based, and that's such a beautiful story and so lovely because it is this sort of continuation of life. And you know, nature is there to show us that, even with just the four seasons that we experience yeah. that those beautiful daffodils come up and then they the flowers the petals fall off and then we're into the, another season and the leaves fall off the trees everything is bare and everything is resting and then it all pushes back up in spring again and we often rally against all of that in our daily lives we try and push and push ourselves relentlessly without honoring when we need to hibernate or to shed things in our life and when to regenerate. And I think nature is it's the most obvious way of looking at that, but it's also the most beautiful because we can see it if we're aware of it. And going back to the start of your question, it's so important to know that we have complete autonomy over what the meaning is. We can put intention our intention, good intention, benevolent intention behind anything we want, and then it has meaning. So you don't have to have this prescribed look at well-being or spirituality where if you waft a certain incense around, it does something. Yeah. You can do whatever you want. It could be planting flowers with intention that it has meaning behind it. Yeah. It can be anything you want. It's your it's your thing, it's your meaning, it's your ritual, it's your ceremony. This is not prescribed stuff, which often the well-being world is. If you do yoga, if you eat this, whatever. This is the opposite. It's your inherent and innate sense of what your intention is. I mean, you mentioned the term prescribing there, uh, and the, the the real sense I get through your book is this, is this real feeling that this is not a prescription. This is not the Fern Cotton methods, no, right? I don't have one. <laughs> this is a, it's kind of like a gentle exploration into a variety of different areas. So, hey, listen, look, have you thought about this, right? I've tried this and this is what's happened. This is where I struggled. This is where it's really helped me. What do you think? Yeah. I think that's a lovely approach. Yeah, like who am I to tell people what to do? I'm just bumbling along like everybody else, trying my best and making mistakes and figuring things out. And I'm never going to come at any subject from an angle of expertise or I've nailed this. I want to show my vulnerabilities and I'm getting things wrong and that some stuff doesn't work for me. But then other stuff is to alleviate other people from stuff they're going through, whether it's yeah. physical, mental or a lack of general connection. So it was just a chance for me to play around and <clears throat> talk to interesting people and try new things out. And as I said in the book, it was it was game changing. It was a, this has been a game changing year. It's been painful in a lot of ways, but it's been really beautiful and game changing. And I feel very grateful that I went through the process of it. Your new book is all about achieving greatness, right? And you write in the book how greatness only really begins once you decide to heal the pain and trauma mm -hmm. of the past. Yes. And, you know, you've touched on that already throughout this conversation that, you know, you have that typical story, Lewis, where you were in your mm -hmm. 20s, maybe your 30s, you're crushing life on... Crushing! From the outside, people were... I was were dominating. Thinking, yeah, Lewis Howes <laughs> is a success, right? But... There's external success and internal mm -hmm. struggle. And, mm -hmm. you know, I often think about energy these days and what's the energy behind a certain behavior? You know, it's, it's the drive to do well coming from a place of lack. You know, I'm not going to let anyone ever do something to me again. So I'm going to get strong. I'm going to make myself big. I'm going to be a great sportsman, mm -hmm. right? Or is the energy coming from a place of abundance and love where you yes. already feel whole? Because I don't know, when I hear your story, Lewis, I was thinking about Michael Jordan in The Last Dance. What really struck me watching that was that, yes, he was the greatest. You know, he's widely considered, you know, possibly, arguably the greatest basketball player of all time. Certainly one of the greatest, right? And... It seemed throughout that documentary that what was pushing him was a feeling of lack, was an internal pain. Mm. And, you know, I often wonder with some of these high performers, and of course, I don't know, you know, his full story. But sometimes I wonder, you know, 
was the success worth it? Was it mm. worth the cost? On the outside or the accolades, I don't mean with Michael Jordan, I mean with many high performers. A lot of the time we find that the energy driving it is a place of lack, not a place of yes. love and fullness. And you also mm -hmm. had, I think, elements of that story earlier on in your life where you're achieving the success, but the energy behind it isn't one that's going to make you happy and give you that inner peace, is it? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. When I interviewed Kobe before he passed, I asked him what greatness was to him. And he talked about, you know, being in a place where you give your ultimate best at the thing you're doing so that you inspire others to give their best and then they inspire others to give mm. their best. So it wasn't about like win at all costs. It was about giving your best in the endeavor you're doing, but being an inspiration, a symbol of greatness for people in your life or anyone that's a witness of what you're doing so that they want to be a symbol for the people in their life and they want to impact people in their life. It's about the ripple effect. Yeah. And it wasn't about like be number one and win at everything. That's greatness. Um, and an interesting story about Kobe, he told me that his first summer, he did like a summer league of basketball when he was like 12 or 13. And he didn't score one point the entire summer. And like every game, there was not one time he scored. And he mentioned that his his parents said, hey, we love you either way. Whether you score every point or no points, we still love you. And he said them saying that gave him permission to then go out and fail and go out and yeah. try harder and go out and like do it from a place of love as opposed to I'm not enough. Let me go prove I'm enough. And again, there's two different paths there's the i'm not enough let me go get big fast strong and do whatever it takes to win and then when you win you might feel enough for a moment until you don't because as the late uh wayne dyer used to say he used to give this analogy i was a big wayne dyer fan where he would say when you have an orange and you squeeze the orange what comes out of the orange is orange juice because that's what's inside the orange. When you squeeze it, orange juice comes out because that's what's inside. When you apply pressure to a human being and you squeeze the human and you put pressure through them and it's adversity, a challenge, life pressures, what comes out of the human is what's inside of the human being. And that might be pain, anger, resentment, mm -hmm. a fear, a drive to be right, uh, make people wrong. And when that's what you see people when there's pressure you see them react or respond in different ways based on what's inside of them, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Yeah. And so that's why we must cultivate what's inside of us to be a, an environment of peace, harmony, love, and an environment of a drive from a sustainable energy, which is abundance, yeah. not from fear, insecurity, or lack. And when we can cultivate that more consistently, again, we're all human beings and no one's perfect here, but when we can do that more consistently, we show up better when life happens, when adversity happens, when we have a, a, you know sickness in our family that we're facing and it's fairly sad and it's hard to deal with, when we have a job loss that we're dealing with, a transition, economy crisis, a crash in the market, and we deal with challenges of life, how we react is based on what's inside of us. Yeah. And so that's why we must face the things inside of us, heal, create new meaning around these memories that cause us to hurt ourselves and others so that we can have more peace moving forward. Yeah, really powerful. That orange analogy is fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. What a privilege to have interviewed Kobe Bryant uh, before he died. A uh, really, really powerful conversation. Just a couple of things on that, Lewis, as you were sharing that story. Number one, I love what you said about what his parents said to him, that we don't mind whether you score or you don't score. We still love you. Yes. And as a parent myself, I've been a dad now for 12 years. As someone, and I've shared this story in my last book and, and many times on the show, as, as, as a child who really felt... Again, I'm not putting blame on my parents this, but mm -hmm. I, for whatever reason, took on the belief that I was only loved when I was top of the class. 
when mm -hmm. I had full marks, when I was the straight A student, right? So I took that belief into adulthood and it has caused me a lot of problems for sure. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of internal pain. Yes, on the outside, it's driven a lot of success. Results. Yeah. yeah, but at a huge internal cost. Again, I feel I've repaired a lot of that now and I, yeah. I really do feel the sense of calmness and contentment. But as a parent, because... Often as parents, we try and overcorrect. You know, we perceive mm -hmm. what happened to us and go, right, that's not going to happen to my child. And I do wonder sometimes, am I overcorrecting with my own kids? But one thing I <laughs> do try and do with them is I want them to know that I love them irrespective yeah. of what grades they get, what they that's do, amazing. whether they've been kind, whether they've not been kind. It's like, I will always love them. And I want them to know that. And just hearing the impact that had on Kobe, I think was really mm -hmm. very powerful for me to hear. It gives me confidence that hopefully I am doing the right thing. Or of course, only time will tell. But the other thing, Lewis, that came up for me is, you were talking about his definition of greatness and that it's about inspiring other people, mm -hmm. right? And I agree with that. But there's a slight clash in my head. Let's say Michael Jordan, for example. There's no question Michael Jordan has inspired millions of people yes. over the last few decades, right? So uh -huh. he ticks off the inspiration box because of his phenomenal play. Even me as a non-basketball fan was inspired by watching him as a kid thinking, wow, that's ridiculous what he can do, right? But if, and again, this is an if, but if he has internal pain and internal struggles that have driven him. Yes, he's inspiring people. Is that still greatness? Mm. I just think it's not the highest level of greatness. Yeah. I think your results are great. Your success is great. But if we as human beings still suffer, then we still have to do work on ourselves. And yeah. we've still got to take a look at why we suffer. I don't think greatness is internal suffering. I don't think that's that's a part of it. Like external results and internal suffering. I feel like it's the harmony you have yeah. within yourself, which I think is the hardest thing to do is to face yourself. Face your insecurities, your shames, your doubts, your pains, the things that people have done to you, things that you've done to people that were not okay, and facing it all. Yeah. No one really likes that. It's not a fun journey. It's not like, oh, I get to go do this today and face the the, the darkest parts of me. That's not enjoyable. Yeah. But I think that work, that intention, that reflection, the integration of healing daily that it takes to, to cultivate more peace. And again, I'm, I'm a human being, so I have challenges and struggles and get flustered every now and then too. But it's the constant work of reminding myself and improving, which, which I think is, is more helpful and useful. Yeah. You know, I lived in a big high-rise building uh, a few years ago here in L.A., and a lot of successful people in this building, a lot of celebrities and famous people and, you know, people with a lot of money. And during COVID, there was a guy who was worth a half a billion dollars who jumped out of the building, and committed suicide. It was the day after Father's Day. And I'm not trying to assume I know what happened or connecting the dots or anything, but it was the day after Father's Day. He didn't have a good relationship with his son. His son wasn't in his life. And um, he had all the money in the world, but it didn't seem like he had love in his heart with, he was alone, he was single, you know, all these different things. So again, I'm not, I don't know what caused it, yeah. but there was a lot of underlying things that, uh huh, that's interesting, that might have influenced it. And there might be some other stuff that he hadn't faced and dealt with internally that caused him yeah. to, to jump. And again, you know, I... I just think when people hurt themselves or want to hurt themselves, it's because they are hurt inside and they don't know how to deal with it yeah. and they don't know how to face it. And so they hurt themselves through being an alcoholic or drugs or, you know, cutting themselves or hitting themselves or causing themselves to get in physical harm, getting in fights or wanting to commit suicide. And there's a, a way to heal that is extremely scary for so many people. And so I get it because it took me so long to yeah. start the process. And you feel like you're going to die when you face these things. It feels like, how could I ever say this? Me talking to a group of people about being sexually abused for the first time, I thought my life was over. I thought 
these people are gonna hate me. No one's gonna yeah. love me. They're gonna kick me. Out. Like I just thought like my life was over and I wasn't gonna make any money anymore. My business is gonna fail because now people really know this about me. Uh, I'm gonna be kicked out of society. That's just like where my my thoughts went. It just was mm -hmm. like uh, you don't feel safe. And so it's one of the scariest things to do to to reveal past pains. And I'm not saying you need to do this publicly, but finding a safe space to do yeah. it, a safe person to talk to, or someone confidential to talk to, I think is important. And it's one of the elements of the greatness mindset. And uh, I'm not sure if I got you a physical hard copy over there, but on page 201, I give a graphic in the book and yep. I'm just, I'm happy to explain it. It's kind of like an assessment. This is to ask yourself and to reflect are you living in a powerless mindset state of being or are you more in the greatness mindset? So this is a way for you to reflect and just ask yourself, you don't have to tell anyone, but just to think about yourself, am I more powerless right now or am I more in greatness? And it doesn't mean you're bad and wrong if you are in a powerless state. It doesn't mean you can't be effective. It doesn't mean you can't get results in your life and get a relationship and all these things. It just means that there are certain things that still have power over you from being more effective from having more joy, more yeah. love, more peace, more harmony, and therefore attracting more of what you want in your life, creating and manifesting more of what you want in your life. So a powerless mindset it is someone that lacks a meaningful mission. And I believe the enemy of greatness is lacking a meaningful mission. You know, there's nothing more dangerous than a man without a mission, a wandering man who's just susceptible to all of life's desires, pleasures, and... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, anything that could pull him away from yeah. something intentional. So lacking a meaningful mission just means you're you're not clear on what you want. And when you're not clear, you're in a state of confusion. And we can have transitions. We can have off seasons. We can have seasons of life where we're in recovery. We are in discovery. But just yeah. be clear that this is a season of recovery and discovery and figuring things out. But that's what you're clear on for that mission. Number two is you're controlled by fear. Again, fear is going to happen, but when it controls us, we are in a powerless state. So we, need, we must learn how to face and embrace it and manage and work with fear, but not let it control us. Number three is crippled by self-doubt. This is something that held me back for many years. Mm. This was the whole, this whole start of the School of Greatness was to figure out how I can overcome self-doubt because I was successful but I still doubted myself, and that's what hurt me and caused me to be insecure, second mm -hmm. guess, people please. I was an extreme people pleaser because uh, I was crippled by self-doubt. Number four, conceals past pains. I think there's 20,000 plus books on mindset and success. If you go on Amazon, you'll see 20,000 different books. Most of them talk about discipline, willpower, which you mentioned, um, hard work, grit, all these things that we think of with success. But I don't know many of them that talk about revealing past pains yeah. and healing. And I just think that is everything. Yeah. You know, you can teach people how to work hard, set goals, you know, show up on time, be consistent. But it's so much harder to deal with the stuff inside of us that is messy and scary. And I just think that's what gives us peace and freedom. So concealing past pains it doesn't mean you're bad or wrong. It just means you're more powerless because you're concealing something. You're afraid that if someone knows this about you, they won't accept you or love you. But typically, it's because you don't accept and fully love yourself. Yeah. And so that's what you're most afraid of. The fifth thing is defined by the opinions of others. Again, this was something that crippled me for years. I wasn't afraid of failure or success because I knew failure was the path to success and I wanted to be successful but I was afraid by the opinions of others. So I would people please, I would get defensive anytime someone left criticism. I would uh, you know, say yes to everyone because I wanted people to like me. And it caused me to feel overwhelmed, stressed, and I would abandon myself. And the, and the sixth thing is drifting towards complacency. Um, I just think you're more powerless when you're not in a state of trying to grow, learn, or create something yeah. to help others. And so, it's just asking yourself, do I have any of these six things that come up from time to time or daily? And it doesn't make you wrong or bad because I've had all of these at different times in my life. And I was still effective in certain areas, but I wasn't feeling the way I wanted to feel yeah. when I was effective. The greatness mindset is driven by a meaningful mission. And Rangan, for me, I have a one sentence meaningful mission that guides me. 
It directs me on which direction to go. It helps me make clearer decisions. It gives me more focus. The greatness mindset is having a clear, meaningful mission and driven by that. Turning fears into confidence. We talked about that a little bit earlier about how I created a list, a fear list. And I went all in on these fears until the fears went away, mm. until they disappeared. And we all are gonna face fears at different times and at different seasons. I'm not a father yet, Rangin, so I'm, I'm assuming when I am a father, I'm gonna have to face new fears, yeah. new insecurities, new uncertainties. Uh, what do I do here? I don't know. And so I'm gonna always need to face new fears at different seasons of life. And we have to turn those into confidence. Yeah. That's greatness. Overcoming self-doubt, again, same thing not being crippled by it, but overcoming it by facing it. Healing past pain. I believe this is greatness. When you can realize that there are some wounds, there's some hurts, there's some things that have happened that have affected you, that has become a, a belief for you, a story, a narrative for you, and you've allowed that to run your life in certain ways. We haven't healed. And so as a doctor, you would never tell someone who breaks an arm to just go out there and start using their arm again, you would tell them, you need to heal that. You need to put a cast on it. You need to set the bone. You need to like just lay around and relax for a while. You need to not work. You need to rest. Mm -hmm. You need to recover. Let the yeah. body heal. Let your mind heal. And then it's going to take some time because it's going to hurt. Once you get the cast off, you have to get your elbow, your wrist back on. It's going to take some rehab. You're going to need three months, six months. For me, it took a year and a half of rehab to get my wrist and my elbow because they put me a bone graft. They took a bone from my hip, put it mm -hmm. in my wrist, and I was in a 90-degree angle like this in, in the cast for six months. Wow. So I couldn't straighten my elbow because it was in this position 90 degrees for six months. The elbow was painful, and that's not what I broke. I broke my wrist. It took a year and a half until I could just get like minimal function. Yeah. And so you're not going to prescribe me, you know what, go out there and just start like hammering away on the weights and doing pull-ups right away and just like using your wrist within the first year, you're gonna say you need to heal. But a lot of times we experience emotional wounds, psychological wounds, spiritual wounds, and we just get right back on the horse the next yeah. day. And we push through the wound and it never fully heals. And that wound is a trigger for us forever. And again, you would never prescribe someone to go out there on a broken leg and start running a marathon the next day. That would be bad advice and you'd lose your your you know license probably as a doctor but we prescribe this yeah. all the time with our emotional wounds and that is not greatness we must heal past wounds create a healthy identity i think a lot of us rankin i don't know if this is a uh, something that happens in the uk but if you would have taken a voice recorder and you could hear my internal dialogue for a lot of the years that I've lived before the last 10 years. And you could have voice recorded what I said to myself. You're such an idiot. You're a dummy. You're never going to amount to anything. You're such a loser. You're worthless. You're, you're an idiot. If you would have heard this over and over again, you would have recorded it. And you would have played it in a loudspeaker on the streets of your city. They'd probably be like, what is wrong with this guy? We got to send him to a mental institution, right? Yeah. A hospital. This guy needs help. And imagine if you'd say these things to your partner, your spouse, your parents, your yeah. friends, your teachers, and you'd speak to them the way we speak to ourselves sometimes. No one would want to be your friend. No one. They'd be like, don't speak to me this way. Don't treat me this way. But for whatever reason, human beings tend to treat ourselves so horribly to ourselves and say the meanest, nastiest things on repeat. That is an unhealthy identity. That is not greatness. And so creating a healthy identity is learning to be a better positive self-coach yeah. as opposed to a negative critic. Give yourself feedback, but be kind to yourself. So creating a healthy identity. And then the sixth thing is taking action with a game plan. For me, yeah. those are the elements of greatness. Those yeah. are the things that we all get to work on and practice consistently. These are not easy things. These are not things that just happen overnight. It takes practice. It takes time. It takes having tools. Yeah, And that's why I wrote The Greatest Mindset because I, I wrote this for me 10 years ago when I was stuck, struggling, in breakdown after breakdown, in transition, trying to figure out who am I, what am I supposed to do? I've been successful, but I feel like I have no purpose. And I feel like I have no love in my heart and I have no peace and I'm in constant breakdown. 
So I wrote this for me, for the you know 10-year-old, 21-year-old, 30-year-old, uh, and current self to have the tools I need to have peace. And I think your um, acknowledgement at the start of the book really reflects that. You know, I dedicate this book to my younger self for having the courage to carry me through pain, my current self for facing my shame and learning how to heal, and to my future self because the journey to greatness has only just begun. A very, very powerful acknowledgement right at the start of the book really speaks to everything you've mm. just been talking about. You, of course, mentioned a meaningful mission. You said you can say yours mm -hmm. in one sentence. What is your meaningful mission? Yeah, mine is to serve and impact 100 million lives weekly to help them improve the quality of their life. And it's clear. It's one sentence. It's one direction. And I'm not beholden to a certain mechanism. Yeah. Again, I didn't say like my goal is to be the number one podcaster in the world. It is to serve 100 million lives weekly. So I'm striving to get to that place to be able to reach and serve in 100 million lives weekly, which allows me to, again, the mechanisms can evolve and change. But the mission is the same and it's clear. And that may evolve, that may change. It doesn't yeah. mean I have to be stuck with this mission for the rest of my life. It's just the season of life that I'm yeah. in, that's the mission that I'm on. When I was on my sister's couch, it was just how do I make enough money to get off my sister's couch? I couldn't think beyond that. I was just like, how do I be a grown up? You know, let me figure this out. Let me overcome fears. That's the season and the mission that I was in. Uh, and then once I was overcoming that, then I was able to see farther and say, okay, what's my new mission? I'm going to transition. Okay, great. Yeah. And I think a lot of people aren't clear on their meaningful mission. They know like, oh, I've got this job that I want to do, or I've got this idea, or I've got this career path, or I've, I want to be in a relationship. Okay, but what is the meaning of it? Yeah. What is the purpose of it? And just this allows you to get clearer on scheduling your time. To make sure you're taking action after watching this video, I've created a free guide to help you build healthy habits. We can all make short-term change, but can those changes become a fundamental part of our life? Often they don't. And that's why in this free guide, I share with you the six crucial steps you need to take. They're really, really effective. If you wanna get hold of that free guide right now, all you have to do is click the link in the description box below. To get clearer on what you say yes and no to. Yeah. Because if I, without a meaningful mission, then I'm just like, oh, there's so many projects I wanna do, I'm gonna do them all. Okay, great. But diluted efforts get diluted results, as my friend Rory Vaden says. And so we don't want to dilute everything. You can you can do that. And that if that's the life you want to live, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's probably not going to be the most impactful on optimizing something. Yeah. So it just depends on what you want. A couple, couple of really important things you've just touched on, Lewis, which I'd, I'd love to just respond to. One is the seasons of life. I think that is so important for people to really take a minute to, to sit with. Because I think sometimes we hear people on podcasts or someone that people look up to say something and think that that has to apply to us at this moment in life and in no. every moment in life. But as you so beautifully put, life changes, your goals change. Mm -hmm. That I think it's a really nice way to think about it. I'm thinking about maybe someone who's listening to the show at the moment who maybe is a mother of children. And at the moment, part of their meaningful mission may well be different from when their kids have left home in five years. Yes, you know, exactly. Because it's a different season in our life. I thought that was really important. But also what you said about your mission, mm. and the mission doesn't really get lost in the mechanism of delivery, right? You can be uh, serving that mission through your books, through your podcasts, through some social media posts. Maybe you're going to go on a book tour and talk to people. You've got multiple delivery mechanisms for that yes. mission, right? And I was thinking when you were talking about someone with that job, well, the job is a mechanism, right? It's a delivery yes. mechanism, but what sits higher than what you're actually doing? That's the point, isn't it? Because then that insulates you in case you ever lose that job or if you retire or whatever. That's when it can get problematic when it's all in on that job. Whereas if the job is serving a higher mission, mm -hmm. that's the message I get from, from that yes. chapter in the book. Would you agree with that? 100%. Yeah. And again, we can't always 
control outside forces or factors, you might get lost from your job. And then if you put your whole identity around a career as opposed to a mission, let's say you're a graphic designer and you put your identity into the career that you're at and you get a job and they, they cut you for whatever reason and they let you go, it's going to be a lot more painful if your mission is the job as yeah. versus I want to be the best designer and I want to create inspiring designs in this industry. Okay, cool. Then you can go to a different mechanism after that. It doesn't mean it may not be challenging and painful and stressful time, but at least your whole identity is not shattered yeah. around one thing. You put it into your effort, you put it into your attitude, your energy, your creativity, your generosity towards the thing you're looking to create in the world. I think that sets you up for more success. All right, let's go to a thought experiment then, Lewis, which just came to Give me. Give it to me. Okay, so you got your mission. You want to impact these 100 mm -hmm. million people every week. Now, of course, being as successful as you are, you have mechanisms by which you can reach a lot of people yep. each week. Now, let's imagine overnight, Mm -hmm. podcasting disappeared, right? Yeah. Social media disappeared, YouTube disappeared, right? So a lot of these delivery mechanisms you currently rely on to meet your meaningful mission, mm -hmm. they vanish. Mm -hmm. What do you do like tomorrow? How do you then approach this mission when all these things that you've relied on no longer exist? Yeah, I mean, if that was the case, it would have to be, I would try to see if there's other mechanisms that could reach masses of people. So is that TV? Is that newspapers? Is that magazine? I would just look for other outlets. Is that WhatsApp? I don't know. I would just look for other outlets. If all those went away and there was no way to reach masses of people in short periods of time, for whatever reason, then my mission would evolve into changing the number. Yeah. And it always starts with one. So even though my mission is to serve 100 million lives weekly, to help them improve the quality of their life. Like if this reaches one person, this book, and you know, it's, it's gonna reach a lot of people, but if it reaches one and it impacts them, I'm also in my mission. Yeah, I'm also living in my mission of service, of impacting one person to improve the quality of their life. And so that is still in part of my mission. And that doesn't mean I've failed if only one person a day is in, is that I'm in service to. The milestone or the end mission would be to get to 100 million lives. That allows me to think creatively and get out of my comfort zone. That allows me to say yes and no to things that could support me getting there faster. That allows me to use my time more wisely to create media, content, and say yes or no to things that could reach more people because that's the goal. If the ability wasn't able to reach more people that wasn't available, I could still have that mission in place that I want to reach 100 million lives every week, but maybe I'm only reaching 10 a, a, a week. I'm still not going to beat myself up because I'm in service. And I think that's what we got to look at. You know, and here's, a, here's an interesting concept for you. It's a great example for you. I wanted to be an Olympian. I wanted to go to the Olympics. My entire life, I wanted to do this. Uh, and when I got injured playing football, I was in my cast living on my sister's couch. And during this time, the 2008 Summer Olympics was on during this time. So I'm kind of down and out. I'm kind of like, you know, a little depressed because I realized my dream of playing football is probably over. And I was in denial for a little bit because I thought, oh, I'm going to heal up in six weeks, come back and train for the next season. But life happened and it took me six months in a cast and another year to recover. But I'm watching the Olympics in 2008 and I see this sport that I'd never seen before ever. And I'd watched every sport, but the sport came on in the Olympics at like 3 a.m. called team handball. And it's pretty much unknown in the US. It's like water polo, but on a basketball court with no water is kind of how it looks mm -hmm. like. And it's, um, it's not that big in USA or the UK, but it's big in other countries in Europe. And I saw this sport and I go, wow, this is fascinating. I feel like this is the sport I was meant to play. It was kind of perfect for my size and my abilities as an athlete. And I said to myself in 2008, I am going to go to the Olympics. This is the dream. This is the mission. And I said, well, I started doing research. Okay, is there teams in the USA? Is there a team in Ohio where I was living? Like, how do I join a team? How do I learn this sport? There was really not much information. And I realized that there were no teams except for club teams in specific cities. 
There was nothing in Ohio. I saw that the national champion club team was in New York City at the time. I tried to reach out to people, try to see if there's a phone number for the club. There was nothing. So I said, okay, when I make enough money, I'm going to move to New York City and I'm going to go play with this team and try to make the USA national team. Two years goes by. I eventually make enough money. I go to New York City. I join this club, this New York City handball club. The first day I get there, I say, my name's Lewis. I'm from Ohio. I'm here to learn handball and make the USA team and go to the Olympics. They all laugh at me. They're all laughing. They're like, this is crazy. Who are you? Go back home. I stick around. In nine months, I practice with the team. I play with the team. And nine months later, I made the USA national team. Now, shortly after that, I go to Buenos Aires and I play in the Pan Am Championships. And then for eight years, I have this dream, this mission in mind that I'm going to make it to the Olympics. Now, it's a team sport. So the team has to qualify. And they only take one country from North and South America who wins the Pan Am Games to go to the Olympics. Again, that's once every four years. So you have to win this one tournament. Now, a lot of teams in South America, a lot of countries in South America that have professional teams and leagues, and they play since they're kids. Mm. No one in the USA plays this sport. So it's very competitive to win the Pan Am Games. And we haven't done it in like, I don't know, 30 or 40 years or something. And so we haven't been to the Olympics in 20 plus years as the USA. But if the USA hosted the Olympics, it would be an automatic qualifier. So I was hoping that we would get an automatic qualifier and we would host the Olympics. That never happened. The last time I played was a couple of years ago. And I did not accomplish the mission. But even though the dream didn't come true, doesn't mean it wasn't a dream come true. The experience, I got to play all over the world. I got to yeah. wear USA against my chest. I grew as an athlete. I became a better leader. I, I, did, I followed my dreams and I didn't accomplish the mission. But I'm not gonna beat myself up for not succeeding yeah. at the end mission because the eight, nine year journey was incredible. Yeah. The friendships I built, what I learned about myself. I traveled, I played against national teams in Israel and Luxembourg and, and the UK, uh, Mexico, Canada, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Chile. I played against Olympic teams and I got to experience like a taste of it. Yeah. But I'm not beating myself up because I didn't accomplish the mission. Yeah. Very powerful. It just didn't happen for me. So I think we gotta we gotta understand that the experiences we have are just as meaningful, even if we didn't accomplish the end goal. And I just think it's the journey of who you become in the process of going after yeah. something that you're excited about. The Olympics, a quarter of a percent of a quarter of a percent of a quarter of a percent of people make the Olympics. Like it's already like the, a crazy thing to try to even do. Uh, so the chances are so slim. And yeah, I wanted to do it and I wanted to be a part of it and go to the athlete's village and walk in the opening ceremony and compete and, and yeah. you know, get to be in that exclusive club of being an Olympian and have that life memory, but it didn't happen. And I can beat myself up for it or I can say, man, you gave it your all. Yeah. You gave it your all and you inspired the people around you. And they then went and gave their all, inspired the people around you, like Kobe said. And I can be proud of that. Yeah, I mean, I think the mind is untapped potential for all of us. I really feel that understanding our mind, being able to work on our minds, getting that mental fitness better, just like we work on physical fitness. Frankly, it's what I spend a lot of my free time doing these days is how, how can I have a calmer mind? How can I make the space between stress and response bigger? What can I do where I can actually have that detachment and actually not just, you know, not just um, react, but appropriately respond? I think that's the gold for all of us. I think it improves our relationships, you know, I, I, you know but, but of course, as a footballer as well. I mean, Gareth, you strike me as someone who, as I've said before, is just a genuinely nice guy. So how do you tell somebody that they're no longer being selected for the England squad when it's possibly been their life's ambition and they've worked hard and they've got in, 
But I'm sure at some point you have to tell someone that bad news. You know, what's your approach to it? Yeah. As my son says, Dad, sometimes you're a dream wrecker, aren't you? And, <laughs> and uh, it, it's the most, for, for me, the most uncomfortable part of the job. Um, we we all enjoy giving people good news. And um, you can imagine every player that's in our squad is a very good player. They're, to get to that point, they've overcome so many hurdles and so many disappointments. Um, but at their club, they're all in the team and they, they're used to playing every week. And we have 23 usually in the squad. So as soon as I name a team, I've got 12 who are unhappy and 11 who are happy. That's, that balance isn't really a very good one. Um, but what I find is that I, I'm always honest. I think people need honest feedback for, for several reasons. They, they, I think if you try to soft soap or sweeten the message, generally you, you're not able, you've got to give them something to go away and work at that can help them to get back in the team. So if there's information about their game that needs improving, I think that honest feedback is important because it's, it's something that you can then refer back to and that as a coach, you can help them to improve. So our job be, should be to help them all to be good enough to come back into the team or in a better space to come back into the team. Um, but also I think if, if we're not delivering that message with clarity, but also with empathy, then you, you lose the respect of the, of the players. And, um, I remember a couple of times I was left out of the team and I didn't really get clear feedback from the manager and I lost a bit of respect for him because of that. And there were other managers that left me out of the team who gave me very clear feedback and I didn't particularly like it at the time. But when I went away and reflected on it, I, I, I had to say, mm, he, he's right there. That, that's, he's right. And I know now what I need to go away and work at so I don't find those conversations comfortable. Um, and I know on my personality profile now that those conversations cost me more energy than, um, than other parts of my job. But if those conversations don't happen, then, and I just put a team on the board without telling somebody they were being left out and why, well, that creates even more problems in the group. I think, I think players respect the fact that you speak to them and they respect the fact they might not agree with the decision, but I think they appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to explain it to them. Um, and then, and then it's part of their responsibility then to go away and work at the things to, that you're suggesting to, to improve and make themselves selectable. Yeah. I really appreciate you sharing that because I think there's a lot of lessons for all of us in that. I think, you know, I call myself a, people pleaser in recovery. You know, I'm, 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 I'm a lot less of a people pleaser than I used to be. And I've, I've unpacked before where that comes from a desire to be loved, desire to be liked, but it, but it, but it comes from a place of not feeling enough. It certainly has in me. And as I become more secure in who I am, I feel I've changed the way I deliver messages like that, because I feel the old me would very much have tried to sugarcoat a message, right? And as she spoke to, to Ariana Huffington recently on the show, and she has a way off, she, they've got a term in her organization called compassionate directness. And it's really great. If you just Google it, I think you would actually really enjoy it from what I can tell from reading your book, Gareth, is it's, it's kind of what you're saying. It's sort of, you say it's how you deliver it. It's honest. It's direct, but it's delivered with empathy. And I think all of us can learn from that with, with colleagues, with, with, our, with our partners, you know, not trying to just sugarcoat what, you know, not really saying what we really feel. It's kind of, I guess in some ways it goes back to our conversation in bra on bravery before Gareth about real vulnerability and honesty. You know, as you said, you, you may not have liked it in the moment, 
but you absolutely appreciated it afterwards on reflection. I mean, have you have you changed that? Do you feel earlier on in your career you sugarcoated that sort of delivery and you've learned that hey, you know what? I can improve here. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um I I think I went on some development courses. Um we we're quite good in our organization we we do uh, 360 feedback from different members of staff and sometimes in the past people might have said oh i'm i'm not quite sure whether gareth agrees with this or whether he doesn't agree with it and i was thinking well i'm sure where i am <laughs> so so therefore my communication isn't right and um uh, yeah it in the short term, it, I suppose it's a bit like sending your children to bed. You know, there's there's been a, a disagreement or they've done something wrong and you send them to bed. And then I would, when they were younger, I would sit there and think, how long can I leave it before I go up and see them and give them a cuddle and make it all feel better, you know? And that's kind of how it is with the players. They come, you know, I call them into, the, into a room or we're going to have a cup of coffee and I explain the decision. And I know they're going to leave there. For, you know, certainly for a period, they hate me for sure. For sure. They, they're not happy with the decision. They don't like me. And that's not somewhere I want to be, really, because we all want to be liked, really. But I recognize now, okay, I've got to work through that. I've got to let them have that moment. I've got to let them get their emotions out of the way. And then we've got to find a way forward of working together hopefully i think i'm very clear that it's not a personal thing it's just a decision for that game or it's a decision on how i view them in compared to some other players and they're all good players so i've got to make sure that they understand that it's not that they're not a good player i don't want them to lose confidence in what they're doing but i'm making it's one person's decision um based on this moment in time and there's a route back into the team and and those doors are always open so uh, I think that's an important process and and it's very important for the harmony of the group as well because you need the guys that aren't starting the game to be ready to come into the game and also supportive of the rest of the team if there's any sports coaches of children listening to this show at the moment or parents whose children are, you know, keen sports advocates or, I don't know, martial arts advocates or whatever it is that they like doing. Do you feel that sort of message of compassionate directness, honesty, kindness, empathy? I mean, how important is it that people around the country, around the world who are in charge of young people in some way how important is it that they apply principles and messages like that in their own lives? I think crucial. If we're a teacher or a coach, our job is to help other people improve and be the best version of themselves. So I don't think our job is just to be critical. Um, our job is to find people doing something well, is to, is to recognize when they're doing things well, our job is to, we can't always give them all the answers, but we can show them where the answers might lie or we can make suggestions as to, to where they can improve. But then there has to be ownership from the pupil or the player of their own. They've also got to take personal responsibility. So if they start to say, oh, it's just because the coach doesn't like me or doesn't deal with me in the right way well also when I was a player it was my responsibility to make myself as selectable as possible so what's what does this coach look for and and it's important that I think as an athlete you're able to ask questions of the coach to to see how do I how do I make myself selectable if I'm not in the team if if you're not getting the right level of feedback so I do think sometimes we think that being the manager or the coach is all about finding the errors and finding the mistakes and nitpicking. And, and sometimes that can just be, you know, if you said to somebody, why did you do that? You'd say, yeah, I know I, I was wrong. I actually, I was looking to pass there and I just, 
they know the error. Usually they know the errors that they've made. It, it's more when there's a trend of behaviors or a consistent technical problem that maybe we can start to resolve or look at or improve. Individual errors, yeah, they're going to happen. I think they're going to happen. It's when there are consistent things that are wrong. You're looking for patterns that that's when you can coach and that's when you can help people to improve. I've read and heard that you're very passionate about mental health. And, you know, is that something that's always been there? Or, you know, is it something that has evolved throughout your career? Because mental health is something that is getting more and more prominence these days. And having someone in a position of prominence like yourself talking about it and being passionate about it, I think is very, very powerful. But I'm interested on a personal level, where has that interest come from in you? I think a greater understanding really that um, this is an area that is far more common um, for people to find difficult. And I think the world is becoming more complex and lives, um, the lives of young people especially, but, but all people really. We talked about there being no switch off. We talked about the impact of social media, you know, young people in the old days might have been bullied at school, but when they came home for most, that was a safe place. Of, of course, there would have been children who suffered at home, but if they were being bullied at school, home was safe. Now they can be attacked in a, uh, you know, online in their own home. There's almost no escape. There's no safe place. Um, and I feel that's, just one area of the world changing and becoming more difficult to handle. There's also this really critical, uh, I feel as if there's an enhanced negativity with what we're all going through. Everybody's dissatisfied at the restrictions and we want a way out of what we're living through at the moment. And of course, there's not the freedom to live our lives as we should. There's not the social interactions. There's not the the basic human needs that we thrive on. So I think the next few years as well with the economy and everything else that that entails are going to be our biggest challenge around mental health. Where I'm encouraged is that this, this conversation is definitely out there now yeah. and it's not being hidden. And there's a lot more discussion about it on television and a recognition that I love the phrase you use mental fitness. I think it, we talk about physical fitness, but mental health feels almost like a, a phrase that brings stigma with it. Mental fitness is a different way of looking at it. Hang on, this is something that I can work out, I can get better at, I can almost start to take control of. Yeah, I think it's just an interesting way of reframing. I don't know, I, I, I certainly can't claim originality with that. I, you know, I, I may have heard it myself, but I, I love it as a concept because we get physical fitness, don't we? We get that. It's like, you know, I'm going to, we all know what physical fitness means. And, and it's, it's kind of an aspiration. It's I want to get fitter. I can practice and get fitter physically. And it's no different, you know, coming back to what you said about the untapped potential for footballers. And I think all of us is in our minds. Well, why wouldn't we work on our mental fitness? And, you know, why, you know, it's, it's arguably one of the most important things to work on because it impacts all of your interactions, not just how fast you can run. But actually, I would argue your mental fitness is absolutely going to have a downstream positive consequence on your physical fitness. Because if you get this right, your physicality is going to come like as a consequence of that. Um so I think it is a, is, a, is, a, is a nice term for people to, to reflect on. You know, social media is something I, I talk about a lot. I have real concerns. You know, I'm not anti-technology, but I do feel that we don't quite know the impact of all this stuff. We're seeing, you know, really quite worrying documentaries like The Social Dilemma. I don't know if you've seen that or not on Netflix. But I'm interested with the footballers, social media, the pressures that we all feel on social media are frankly ramped up to a completely different degree 
if you're an England footballer, A, the number of followers, B, the fact that you simply cannot have that large a following. Even if you have 1% of negativity, that is a lot of people, right? When you have that level of following. So is there something you've had to, within the organization, teach footballers how to manage social media, how to manage the pressures with that? Because I'm wondering if we can learn anything from what they learn. Mm. Well, unfortunately, we haven't cracked it. So, so of course, there have been really positive examples of some of our players using social media to make a massive difference in society. Raheem Sterling um, talking about racism, Marcus Rashford with with his his projects on feeding um, feeding the nation's children. So so we've seen the very best of what social media can bring. Um, but I don't know how they live with it because I don't know about you, but if I get 10, 10 lovely comments, it's only the one negative one that, I, that I'm drawn to and I'm thinking and playing it back in my head. The, the 10 positive ones are gone. And the, I think you, you'll know this better than me, but I think the brain is wired to have more negative thoughts. We have a negativity bias. It's what's kept us alive for our evolution. You know, we, we, before we lived, you know, relatively safe lives, um, and I appreciate I'm saying that in, you know, in a very challenging year, but relatively safe compared to the way we used to live. You know, we had to be wired to look for that negative. Is that a line that's approaching the camp? You know, that's what would keep us alive. So we've still got that ancient heart wiring. And we're trying to, you know, our brains are using that in the modern worlds where, you know, um, Professor Robin Dunbar, this evolutionary biologist, has something called the Dunbar number, saying that our brains have only evolved to know, I think, over the course of our entire life, 150 people, right? That's it. And so if you think about how many contacts and followers and, you know, friends we have on social media now, it's far beyond what these brains are wide for. So to say you, I think the fact that you guys haven't cracked it probably gives us all a lot of hope to go, okay, <laughs> those guys with all the kind of money and resource on the England football team haven't cracked it. Well, maybe we could take the pressure off ourselves a little bit in terms of us not cracking it. Yeah, but I do, I, my suggestion to them is always, Look, I'm not saying don't look at it because I'm not from a bygone era where I'm saying, oh, I don't understand social media. I, I see the power of being able to connect with people and that interaction. But I, I also recognize that there are moments where we feel more vulnerable. Maybe we haven't slept so well. Maybe in our world, we have, we've just played poorly. Or, Well, it, if we've played poorly, we probably know that anyway. <laughs> We don't need the affirmation of that from thousands of messages, you know. I think in the old days, you'd, you'd pick the paper up, you were given a mark out of 10. I, I knew what it was going to be. I didn't need to look. Oh, it's a, oh, it's a five. And, but by reading it, I felt worse the next day. And I'd think, well, why have I done that? Because I knew I was rubbish yesterday. So I didn't need the confirmation I was rubbish to just push me further into the ground. And I think in, in the world now, that's so instant. And even within a game, we could win a game, having been a goal behind. If the players went through their timeline from the first 30 minutes of the game, they're getting hammered for this and hammered for that. And then by the end, they're the hero because they've scored the winning goal. And it, it's we've got to try to ride beyond that instantaneous emotion, I think, to stay a little bit more level. I, I think that would be better for our mental health and well-being. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you mentioned the good in social media there, and there's some obviously some great high profile uh, examples recently of footballers using their profile to do real good across society, which has been incredible to see. Um, you mentioned Raheem Sterling and racism, and I, I wasn't necessarily going to talk to you about this today, but given that it's come up in that context, I shared with Pippa Grange when I spoke to her one of the reasons why I have 
fallen out of love with football. So I'm someone who grew up idolizing the game. I would go to Anfield regularly. Under Rafa Benitez, I'd follow Liverpool all around Europe. I went to Champions League finals. Um, Istanbul 2005, 2007, I'm in the stadium in Athens and we're not doing well. The team are one nil down. And it's a very different atmosphere to what it was in Istanbul. And within the home section, me with my home shirts on, me and my friend who is uh, Caucasian, um, three, you know, even now it's funny. I thought, you know, it's three lads turned around and were incredibly uh, vitriolic in the language they used against me. Um, and it was really hard. It was one of those things where I remember that. I remember feeling scared. I remember that because, because frankly, the security in the stadium was very lax, we could just leave and walk into a different part of the arena and sit somewhere else, which I think is problematic in itself. But my mate said, hey, listen, let's, let's just get out of here. Let's go to another part of the stadium. And, and it's funny because I'm someone who used to literally live for football. And I can't say it's just that, but I think there's a side to football, which has nothing to do with the beautiful game that is football, but the surroundings of football where, you know, I face that abuse. I know that's ultimately football is just a, a subsection of society. It's not, you know, there, there are you know, people who come to football matches are just representative of everyone in society. So I'm not blaming football for that. But I think when I became a parent, Gareth, this is the other thing which really affected my love for, again, not the game, because it is a beautiful game, but the, the noise around the game is the fact, I just thought, you know, I'm trying to bring my son up to be a kind, compassionate, and my daughter, person who treats everyone the way they'd like to be treating themselves. These are the really values that my wife and I hold dear. These are the main things I try and teach my children. I thought, it's funny, you walk into a football stadium and behavior seems to be almost permissible that would never be permissible outside a football stadium. You know, you can't shout the... And I don't want to put you in a difficult position because I appreciate you're England manager, but I also feel I'm sure you'd, you'd like to hear what a former football fanatic has to say. It's kind of like, I feel, well, why is it okay in a stadium that thousands of people can shout abhorrent abuse at the referee, but you walk outside that football stadium and you just, you're not allowed to do that on the street. You know, that's kind of verbal abuse to someone. But I was never critical of it as a teenager. I thought, oh, you know, that's what's done at football games. Do you know what I mean? I kind of feel now, I think, well, football is a gorgeous game, but there's a lot around it that I think is putting people who used to love it, putting us off. And um, I, I just wonder, I wonder if you have any thoughts to share on, on what I just shared. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating observation and it, it hurts me when I I hear um, people talk about experiences within stadiums like that that take them away from what is a, a beautiful sport and you know your, your passion and that you feel you you don't want to take your children. That's that's so sad to hear. One of the most rewarding things for me coming back from Russia in 2018 was that. The people who stopped me on the street were from every background, every, you know, different religions, different heritage, for, you know, all, all English. Our, our support, our fan base is um, just from so many different backgrounds representing modern England. And, and in some ways, we've, as a game, got to catch up to that because... You're, you're absolutely right. Some of the things, even as a manager, that you experience and the the ways people people speak to you, uh, I suppose it's a bit like the social media. People say things on social media that you think, surely, if we were standing together in the pub, you wouldn't, you just wouldn't say that, or you wouldn't dream of personalising that by copying me in on it. So, I, I just think across society, I, I think the game is a reflection of society yeah. and 
we have, in particularly times like this, we've got to show more tolerance. Um, we're all a product of our education, our upbringing, and to have an understanding of difference and an acceptance of difference, I think is so important as we move forward in life. Um, and it feels as if we're, uh, during the start of lockdown, everybody was pulling together and everybody was out recognizing the National Health Service and we were fighting this together. And yet there've been lots of moments over the last couple of years, and I have to say, you know, the vote to leave uh, uh, Europe with Brexit, I felt that there were things that pulled us apart and were uh, where we weren't together uh, on things and not accepting of difference and not not having an understanding and I and I think our children don't don't recognize that world uh, you know they're born into yeah. the world with no prejudice they're born into uh, my kids felt as european as they felt english frankly yeah. they didn't you know why why are we leaving europe you know we travel it's 2 hours to there and it's 2 hours to manchester or it's 2 hours to wherever you know what's the yeah. What's the big deal here? So uh, I just think that general kindness to each other and tolerance and understanding of difference, if we work collectively as a as a country, can be so powerful. And there are some problems in the world that, frankly, we've all got to work together to cure. And that might be, at the moment, it's the virus. Um, there's obviously... The, the ecology of the planet that if we you know we can't have half the countries working towards that and half not so there are so many things that really we should be working powerfully together um and and yeah maybe we're dreamers but it would be lovely to think that that would be possible in the future yeah no, I'm an optimist as well. And, and I think you're, you're dead right. Football is just, it's such a big game. It's just a reflection of society. It's not, you know, it, it is. And I think football also has the power because of its prominence to change things. We see, you know, wonderful stories in Liverpool that since Mohamed Salah started playing there, it looks as though, you know, Islamic racial attacks have gone down significantly, certainly from some of the media reports I read, which again, it shows, oh, wow. And we do have such a luxury in this country of players from all over the world playing mm. that you know, if you're a football fan and you, you do have, or you were brought up with prejudice, but your favorite player happens to come from a different country and they're knocking in goals each week. Well, you know, that's a pretty powerful way of starting to chip away at that prejudice and go, oh, well, I kind of love, I love him when he's scoring and putting me at the top of the premiership. Maybe that should be reflected in other aspects of my life. You know what I mean? So I, I actually, I'm an optimist. I get the sense you are. And I think football has the power and the potential to really create wonderful change in the world. Gareth, honestly, talking to you has been an absolute joy, honestly. You know, I, I, I really enjoyed this interaction. I think what you've written about is going to be so helpful for so many people. Um, you know, I urge people who've, who've got kids who are really into football, I think they would very much like a copy of this book. Um, but actually, it goes beyond that. I really think this goes far beyond football and will help all of us acquire skills, acquire insight into how we can live, you know, happier, healthier, more content, more fulfilled, calmer lives. And I really want to, you know, publicly acknowledge you for doing that. The podcast is called Feel Better, Live More, Gareth, because when we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of life. I wonder if you'd feel happy sharing some of your kind of top practical tips for people listening right now who want a few gems for them to take and apply in their own life I wonder what advice does the England manager have for them? <laughs> well, goodness me. Uh, I mean, I hope people aren't expecting extreme wisdom at this point, but uh, I've found that the most basic things have kept me on track. And um, at, at the root of it, you, you mentioned how your mental well-being has an impact on everything else. And definitely affects the physical when a team are suffering on the pitch 
um, and they're losing on the pitch, the, the brain is the first part that goes. Um, and people say they're not they're not running, they're not trying, they're not they're not trying hard enough. But actually, it's because they're being blocked from here. And so I'm always conscious that to keep my brain alert and alive, the basics of how I eat, how I sleep, exercising, um, giving myself time to to step away from work. They're the most simple things I do. I, I live in the countryside, so I'm able to go and walk the dogs and, and get out and switch off. But I know that my physical well-being helps my mental well-being and vice versa. And I, I do think those basics are, are, are very straightforward. If I've slept well and I've, I, I'm, I feel stronger and I feel healthy and I feel I can take on any challenge, if I haven't slept well for a long period of days or my diet hasn't been right or I've not been able to exercise, I don't feel quite as robust and I don't feel quite as able to take everything on. And I've just found those simple things that I know. It doesn't mean I I never drink or I don't go and enjoy myself or I don't pig out on chocolate at certain times, but but at the right times and, and in moderation and and generally to get back on track if I'm struggling, I know I need to to sleep and recover and give my body the chance because if I've not got the energy, then I can't help the people I'm working with or my family um, and I can't affect the things I want to change. If that conversation resonated with you, here is another incredibly powerful one that I really think you're going to enjoy. That is one of the most important questions in this world right now. Are you living the life you want or are you living the life you've been programmed? And the answer, unfortunately, is most of us are living the life we've been programmed.